the retail stock activity has been dreadful. Over the last four or five months, people have been so underinvested, lack of conviction, they just still need to put some money to work. I think investors should be a bit cautious here. The market still believes that the Fed is going to have to cut before the end of the year. The only way the Fed actually cuts rates this year is if there is a recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. One stock absolutely flying. NVIDIA up by 25% in the pre-market. TK adding some serious weight to that market cap this morning. It's the way it's up. It's a game changer. I'm not smart enough to tell you what it means in generative AI in faster computing, but it's truly game changing. Even if you don't care about the big seven stocks lifting everything up, this is different than what Microsoft does or what Google does. The City, Piper Sandler, Barclays, all raising their price targets on the stock. City keeping it simple, 11 billion reasons to stay long. Piper <laughs> Sandler says an unprecedented influx of orders associated with AI. Barclays say this was at least a quarter early and Lisa, extraordinary in magnitude. Evercore ISI said, what can we say other than just wow? Basically, they absolutely blew out of the water expectations. Right now, we're looking at potentially one of the biggest one-day increases in market capitalization in U.S. history. And we're looking at a valuation for this company with just a fraction of the sales of Amazon that is the same almost as Amazon.com. So this raises a question, is the hype more than the actuality, number one? And number two, what's the potential risk? I know you guys are going to get up my case for this, but what's the potential risk with the tit for tat going on with China? There was great framing from the team here at Bloomberg overnight when they put this story together, just to build on your comparison to Amazon. Compare it to Intel. The chip maker is more than six times the size of Intel, a company that had more than twice NVIDIA's annual revenue last year, Tom. This is about growth, and people are very excited about the growth of this company. It's about growth, but it's a very strategic discussion about the length of the model. Like in the cloud computing space, our Anurag Rana makes clear there's a five-year window of growth there. I think what they said yesterday is they see a more persistent, predictable growth in generative AI. It's not... I, I came away with the idea, John, as a complete amateur, that all of a sudden AI is not some bubble or something to chat about that these people are actually minting revenue and margin from it. In a major way and quickly, oh. looking forward to catching up with Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence later this hour on this story. We also need to talk about what's developing in this bond market. Ten consecutive sessions of yields climbing at the front end of the curve. We're talking about yeah. a 50 basis point move over the last 10 sessions, Tom. This is really interesting going into this debt ceiling impasse. Treasuries aren't rallying. Right. They're selling off. Thursday before Memorial Day, I had a fan from Perth call in last night. And, you know, he said, is this real or do you guys just take the vacation off? And I said, no, this is tangible on Thursday, tangible tomorrow on Friday into a three-day uh, weekend. And you see it first in the bond market, but you also see it with this idea of convexity in foreign exchange. There's accelerating tendencies towards strong dollar and FX bouncing off that. I'm struggling to pair this idea of the yield increase with the debt ceiling debate. And I don't know how much this is just this feeling that perhaps the Fed will skip the next meeting in terms of a rate hike, but then we'll hike rates in July. That seems to be more on the table. And there seems to be this feeling banking crisis over. Perhaps it never was a banking crisis and people are getting back to that issue rather than really focusing on the debt ceiling. That's kind of the feeling under the market. I can tell you this, dollar's stronger. The euro against the dollar really close to breaking 107 in the last couple of hours. 107.14, the lower the session. 107.31 right now. Some really interesting stuff going into some data a little bit later. This is how the stage is set. Equity futures on the S&P 500 on the Nasdaq doing OK. And you can thank NVIDIA for that one. S&P 500 futures positive 0.7%. Yields up just a single basis point on a 10-year 375.35. And there it is on the screen. Bramo, the euro against the dollar, 107.30. It's just shocking that the dollar is strengthening in light of some of the potential default of this nation and the potential downgrade or the watch for downgrade by Fitch. We can get to that later. We're also watching today, 8.30 a.m., initial jobless claims, followed by pending home sales for April in 10 a.m. Also, we get information about the emergency borrowing from the Federal Reserve by banks around 4.30 p.m., key to see whether the banking crisis really is over or never happened. I'm very curious to see whether we see any tick up in initial jobless claims, because right now we're not seeing it. And without this, I don't see how people can start talking about rate cuts with any conviction 
uh, by year end. Today, retail earnings continue. We get um, Best Buy, Dollar Tree, and Ralph Lauren before the bell, Costco and Gap after the close. Retailers have done really well this year, and I think this is sort of also a sort of conundrum amid the gloom that everyone's been talking about, up more than 15 percent, despite the fact that people are talking about recession still. Uh, and we do get Fed speak, just in case you guys were worried about not hearing from Federal Reserve officials. We are going to hear from uh, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin at 9.50 a.m., Boston Fed President Susan Collins, John, around 10.30 a.m. Very cool. Looking forward to it. Joining us now is Larry Adam, the Chief Investment Officer at Raymond James. Larry, let's break this interview up in two. We can talk about the debt ceiling in a moment. I want to talk <clears> about this rip-roaring rally in tech so far this year. Is that something you want to fight or participate in? Now, we want to participate in it. I mean, if you look at tech, it continues to reinvent itself over and over. The latest generation is going to be AI. And I think as you look at the visibility of earnings, you, you continue to see a strong uh, earnings coming. And I think that that's important because a lot of people will continue to say that tech has gotten expensive. But when you start to factor in how much tech has been able to beat their earnings, I don't think it's as expensive as what people think. And I think that trend is going to continue. Is tech just big tech or is it all tech? Is it basically time to go into some of the beaten up smaller tech stocks that aren't necessarily as profitable? Now, I prefer bigger tech. I mean, first of all, they're much more diversified than those smaller tech companies. I think that's an important discriminating factor, right? Back 20 years ago, tech was one trick ponies where they had one product, one piece of software, hard, hardware, software, where they had to fight the upgrade cycle. Now they're much more diversified. They have plenty of seeds planted that can continue to generate their earnings going forward. So I, I continue to like the big tech names. And by the way, from the index level, as you guys have just stated, that's what drives the index. So I think you have to be there. Larry, um, I, I, just because you're down south, I want to go to DeSantis and the and the conference call with Mr. Musk that ran like a Raymond James Swiss watch that we saw last night. You really emphasize second half of a third year of a presidential administration. Discuss the second half of a third presidential year. Well, I think it's important because what tends to happen in the markets is that momentum tends to beget momentum. And if you look at the strong start that we've had to this year, the first 100 trading days, which, by the way, today's the 100th trading day of the year, when it's up more than 8%, the, the rest of the year tends to be strong. If you look at this presidential election cycle that you're referring to, it's from June to the end of this year, historically, 92% of the time, the market continues to be positive. And that's been consistent through time that this third year of a presidential term is fairly strong. Does cash at 5%, 4.8%, whatever, is that competition for your bullish view? I mean, it's clearly become more competition today, right? I think at the beginning of this year, we were much more uh, positive on the equity markets with upside of you know 15%. But clearly, we've had a rally, mm -hmm. and our upside to our target now is around 6%. So clearly, it's become more competition. But I still like the equity markets longer term for people that have a long-term horizon. Tom went to the politics, so let's finish there. Larry, the death ceiling debate of the moment. What are you advocating that clients should do? I, I still think that this what's going on down in Washington is, is still pretty much noise, right? I mean, I think the, the looking putting you know uh, the U.S. on watch by by uh, Fitch is just another warning sign across the bow. I think in the end we get a deal at the very last second. If we don't, I think the downside in the market is probably five to seven percent. But then, as I always say, the fourth arm of the government. The uh, stock market will come to the rescue. We see a down, you know, we see that downward movement in the equity market. That'll bring people back to the negotiating table and we'll get a deal done and we'll move forward. Is there a signal here that you're sealing dollar strength despite the concern of a U.S. default? Does this basically fly in the face of people who were questioning the preeminence of the dollar as the global <clears throat> currency and prompt you to actually go more into the dollar? Look, I, I still think the dollar will continue to be the dominant currency. I really don't see any other currency out there that can really challenge it. This is not a new story. People have been talking about the dollar <laughs> being challenged with the yen back in the 80s, the euro in the 1990s and 2000s. I don't think there's any question that the dollar will, will remain the dominant currency sure. going forward. I, I think the two factors out there right now is that when you focus on the euro, the euro land is probably going to continue to raise interest rates. The U.S. is going to continue to have better, more dynamic growth going forward. So we're looking for more of a range bound, particularly versus the euro between 105 and 110. And for the most part, that's where it continues to be. John, he's way too optimistic for 6.09 a.m. I mean, Larry's <laughs> way too optimistic. <laughs>
Larry Adam, F. Raymond James, thank you, sir. That was great. It's not so much about the US dollar <clears throat> for me, Lisa. It's more about what's happening in Treasuries. The question coming into all of this, if things get messy, are you a buyer or a seller? Traditionally, you're a buyer of Treasuries, right? That's what would happen. It's really intriguing for me to see just what's happening at the front end of the curve as this is playing out. Ten consecutive days, we've added 50 basis points into the front end as this has been playing out down in Washington. And if you take a look, not just at the two-year, if you take a look at the at the maturities that come due in about 21 days, for example, you see yields of almost <clears> 7%. I mean, nobody wants to own these. No one wants to take that risk. And granted, that's on an annualized basis, so they're not necessarily getting that yield. But still, people are concerned about taking risk that still does seem I, like risk. I understand this will break. There will be claims, as you mentioned at the top, Lisa, that will elevate, four-week moving average will elevate. Until that happens, do we have to begin to frame out 6% full faith and credit paper? Very few people are there. Jamie Dimon's there. But I think very few people are looking, John, at this yield move. You're talking about 3.75% on a 10-year. Debt crisis over. We move on. Where's that go? The problem is the same problem <clears throat> that we started the year with. Risk cuts both ways, yeah. both in risk assets to the upside and to the downside. And I think Morgan Stanley and the team, Bram Weissen has been great on this. Jim Caron, fantastic on it as well. Just acknowledging that risk cuts both ways. You look at what's developing in Europe right now, and that's fascinating too. You've got the surprise index. So that's the economic data coming in relative to expectations, just rolling over aggressively in the last month or so. And that's been captured in the FX market. At the same time, you've got inflation still really sticky both in Europe and in the UK, much more specifically. So the UK faces the prospect now of needing to raise interest rates potentially into a weaker European economy. That's problematic. So we're going back to the story of, say, late last year where we saw this rip-roaring strength in the US dollar, and that was your backdrop. Because yields on gilts right now, Lisa, they are in and around those kind of levels. And this is a moment where you've got Germany falling into a technical recession as well. So to your point, hiking into weakness is now the base case after all these people were talking about Europe getting out of some of the slow growth and really accelerating. It's just a really fascinating and almost confusing moment for macro right now and the global economy. We'll try and address some of that with Phil Camparelli of JP Morgan Asset Management. We'll do that in the next hour. If you are just tuning in, welcome. Equity Futures doing nicely. NVIDIA absolutely flying in the pre-market, up 26%. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. NVIDIA on track to beat Apple for a record single day market gain. Now shares are surging in pre-market after the company's bullish forecast boosted confidence that the chip maker can keep its business thriving by focusing on artificial intelligence. Now if that gain holds, its value would rise by $219 billion to an all-time high of $974 billion. And that would top Apple's $191 billion one-day pop in November. Ukraine is gearing up to begin its anticipated counteroffensive as soon as it receives the necessary weapons and equipment from allies. That today from a top advisor to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. He spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. We will further be preparing the counteroffensive. And as soon as we will be ready, with the support of our partners for delivering us and continue to deliver us uh, high-level artillery, uh, uh, enough ammunition, uh, battle tanks and uh, uh, armored vehicles, as soon as we get it, we'll start this counteroffensive. Uh, definitely it will be resultful. Joska also dismissed Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban's statement that Ukraine can't win the war with Russia. Migration to the UK surged to a record last year. According to the Office of National Statistics, an estimated 606,000 more people moved to the UK than left. Now that's up from 488,000 the previous year. The numbers will put the pressure on Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who has pledged to limit the flow. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. They want to spend 30 billion more than they spent this year. I, I've been very clear. I will not put a bill on the floor that spends more money next year than this year. House Republicans are determined to either extract deep, painful cuts that will hurt 
the health, the safety, or the well-being of everyday Americans or crash the economy. So things are going really well between Heist <laughs> Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy <clears throat> speaking to Fox Business as the war of words continues on the debt ceiling. Fitch with the reality check overnight, warning that the U.S. credit rating may be at risk. This is what the agency had to say. Fitch still expects a resolution to the debt limit before the X date. However, we the believe X-days. risks have risen that the debt limit will not be raised or suspended before the X day, and consequently that the government could begin to miss payments on some of its obligations. Risk is moving in the wrong direction, Tom, and I think that's the conclusion of a lot of people, including Michael Faroli over at J.P. Morgan. Yeah, the risk is moving in the wrong direction. There'll be updates today. I'm sure we'll get headlines out here as they stagger into their ever-so-long weekend. I'm not even sure when they return to Washington to create further damage. What I would suggest, John, is all of a sudden is, 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 is we crash towards June 1st. you got to watch Secretary Yellen and her team about cash on hand. June's next that's week. You think. Keep coming back to that, don't we? Yeah. It's next week. I, I go back to cash. Anyway. Where's your number right now? 60 gazillion? I haven't looked, Tom. I haven't yeah, looked. I'll get I haven't up on the looked Bloomberg either, in a but moment. let's say it goes to 28 gazillion, you know, under 30, three zero just as a amateur number. You know what? This is a big deal. This is the money on hand to pay the obligations. And the only response is how do the conservative Republicans react? Agreed. Nothing else matters. I mean, that's all there is uh, to it. Interesting market. I want to make clear on a Thursday before Memorial Day, the markets are really on the move. We're going to stay on theme here with the politics of New York. And with wonderful perspective, Leslie Vinja Murray joins head of U.S. and America's program at Chatham House. We can go five different ways with her, but I really think we've got to stay on the distance to June 1st as well. When you hear X date, I'm going to assume, Leslie, that was not in your textbooks in school. How do you interpret the X date? I mean, June June first is soon. This is uh, this is you know around the corner and with a very long weekend ahead of us, not only uh, in the United States but also here in the UK. The world's watching this, um, and and that you know if the um, if brinkmanship is designed to be credible to force somebody's hand, it's certainly looking credible as we've seen from this you know risk to the U.S. credit rating. Uh, just last night, Tom. I would assume many of the players here could care less what the foreign response is to this debacle. Explain right now, to pick one group, conservative Republicans holding their speaker uh, at bay here, explain what the foreign response, the ramification of that is to conservative Republicans and to America. Sure. I mean, you're absolutely right that this is inside inside Congress, certainly on the extremes of the of both parties, to be fair, very much a domestic issue. I think that there are plenty of people in the U.S. government that are well aware of the international ramifications. Um, but, you know, one of the very interesting things, um, if we do get to uh, a deal, which um, I think many of us who look backwards assume that we will, Um, as uncertain as it feels right now, is that it might actually be something that forces a degree of bipartisanship and forces the middle to compromise. We're hearing that, you know, it might take as many as 100 Democrats to get this bill passed. I mean, that's actually quite interesting in the current political context that you would actually get the middle uh, saving this coming from both parties. But if you look again, Tom, at the polls Americans want to see a deal, but they're very divided along partisan lines on what they think that should entail. And Republican voters think that spending cuts, you know, they bought the line that spending cuts are important and Democrat Democratic voters have, have bought the bought the line that its party is projecting. It hasn't been a secret how I feel about this whole discussion. I think a lot of people feel the same, where it's exhausting and irritating to uh, an nth degree to hear about it again and again every year. There is a question of what happens after there is some resolution one way or another and what kind of fiscal cuts there could be to the U.S. spending. Is there a new wave of austerity kind of percolating out, not just in the U.S., but globally, but it will be driven by some of these debates and by the U.S.? You know, maybe, but I would say we don't live in an age of austerity at all. Quite the diff- quite the opposite. We live in an era of glo- of different kind of globalization where people expect uh, the state to do a lot more. Certainly in the United States, they expect the state to do a lot more than the- than they ever did before. Where there's a focus on you know a new industrial policy, where there's a sort of a demand for a response because they've been told um, for many years now that they are losing out. 
Uh, and, you know, we've seen even in the current discussion that there are certain things that are protected, obviously, Social Security, Medicare, um, defense is going to be protected because obviously the Republicans don't want to see cuts there. I think one of the key questions is, you know, how if we get to a post deal, which I assume we will, um, this conversation about spending is going to take place in the context of an intense political season. Uh, DeSantis is now on the scene. There will be more. Uh, we're leading up to the primary. So talking about spending cuts, you know, at a general level might sell with many uh, fiscal conservatives. But when you get down into the weeds and you talk about education or housing or transportation, these are all things that Americans have been promised will get better. Infrastructure is defined very broadly now. It's not just about roads. It's about all of these things, digital access. And that requires, uh, there's a sense that that's going to require spending um, not cuts. Just to underscore what you said, there is a belief out there on Wall Street that whatever happens, it will actually probably be negative for growth because it will lead to some level of restraint. You're pushing back against that. Is that correct? Saying that that's not the case. If anything, this is just a prelude to an expansion with some political dressing so that people don't really see it that way. I think that it's an unresolved issue. We're, we're, in a, we're in a period where there is a push for spending. There's a push for public investment. And there's a, you know, a uh, the, the belief that that's going to come from the market has been uh, unsettled, and and we've seen that it's the pandemic has unsettled it. Um, the the argument that Donald Trump really invested in a certain part of the American public that they had they had not been well served has really created the basis for a view that the state, the government, needs to look after people. This is a really we are living through. Um, at least maybe not at the level of, you know, what actually gets delivered, but certainly at the level of public expectation, a very significant change in the American electorate. Leslie, what an 18 months we've got coming up. <clears throat> Thanks for being with us. Leslie Vinger Murray there of Chatham House. I've got that number for you, Tom. It's actually risen over the last couple of days. So the Treasury cash balance is back at about 76.5 billion, okay. had Good. dropped to about 57 last Thursday. Worth pointing out that two Thursdays ago, that number, Tom, was north of 140 billion. Yeah. And that very same week, that number was at about 180, pushing 200 to start that week. So things have come down pretty rapidly, but just over the last couple of days, and this really captures what we've discussed several times over the last week or so, that it's very lumpy, that you can have days yeah. where things start well, to climb and then days when it starts <clears throat> to go back down again. But at the moment, right. as it stands, the latest data, that balance, Tom, sits at 76.5 billion. You know, the honor of having Douglas Holtz Eakin on the show today, he's a guy at 60,000 feet, ex-CBO, heavyweight budget guy. But then there's the visceral thing. Last night, they were at the Washington-San Diego Padres game. Senator, the Washington senators beat and the Nationals now, Lisa, that was a joke. The Washington senators beat the Padres, and those people have to go to Treasury today and cut checks. That's the visceral part of this, is they actually sit there. What did you say the number was now? 76.5. $76 and they have to actually cut checks. That's the end result of all this mumbo-jumbo standing out in front of the White House. Did they cut the Jacks checks at the baseball game? No, they go to the to baseball the game and they watch the Senators beat the Padres. The and then they wake what, up. Do you know what it was? They wake up, they go to the cash room and the I'm treasury. <laughs> I know, that's why you're like, Too please, uh, go. Please. <laughs> you know, until recently, John, a lot like the Bank of England, they oh, wheeled the gold and the bills and the notes into the cash room at the treasury. They still do that, Tom. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you hang around Ted Williams station, was the manager see that happen the on a Thursday I'll send you over to Wayne on a Thursday Tom midday you see him walking across the road with all the gold it's amazing really? to see yeah I'm yeah yeah very yeah, cool yeah, yeah you'll see it <laughs> <laughs>anyone thinking about making a trip to bank station to have a look at the gold coming out of the bank of england it was don't do that don't do that <laughs> it's, not, it? it's not going to happen bonk. okay bonk station bonk. yeah okay bonk. maybe a few centuries ago equity futures on the s p 500 I you're are positive serious. because of one name this one name nvidia is absolutely flying in the pre-market uh, by about 27 percent it's a big stock now. It makes up about 2% of the S&P, makes up close to 6% of the yeah. Nasdaq 100. And this is what's happening 
at the index level off the back of this. Just some big moves <clears> for you. <throat> NASDAQ 100 up by 1.9% because the enthusiasm around AI, Lisa, is just bleeding into the other AI names. And to be completely honest, the NVIDIA orders for their chips absolutely completely blew out the expectations. So there is something tangible here, but the hope underpinning this there is that go. this will be the transformative uh, moment akin to the internet back 40 years ago. We did a luxury with Oliver Chen yesterday. You look at LVMH and Hermes and the others where the multiples they are. NVIDIA's got a 50 multiple looking forward versus Apple with a 28 multiple. This is a premium priced growth story. And people getting very excited about the growth that it could produce. Look at some of these price targets, City 420, Piper Sandler 440, Barclays 500. I've gone through some of these calls already, but City, just keeping it simple, 11 billion reasons to stay long. And I know many of you right now <laughs> staying long and perhaps for good reason. Let's turn to the bond market. This has been fascinating to see. 10 consecutive sessions of yields climbing. This is number 10 up by four or five basis points on a two year from close to 390 all the way up through 440, wow, 442. 442. Wow. It's a big change over wow. the last 10 sessions. Encouraged by some of the Fed speak out there, but not all of it. A real split on the committee on the FOMC in the latest minutes. Some ready to stop, several ready potentially to keep on going and hiking in June. And we'll see what <coughs> happens between now and then. In between, June 2nd payrolls, 13th CPI, and hopefully, hopefully some kind of debt ceiling resolution as well. This is the standout in the FX market right now. Just plain old boring vanilla euro dollar. This currency pair down from 110.95, pushing 111 at the end of April, all the way back down to 107.29. At least a negative 0.2% on the session. This is, to me, the story of the moment. Is this the pain trade of the moment in a way? Because the first half of this year has been defined by a flight into the riskier <clears throat> markets, into the non-U.S. kinds of domiciles. Do we see a sudden reversion of that? Especially in the face of a debt ceiling debate, it kind of flies in the face of the logic that really played out during well, the beginning I, of this year. I'm hearing a more bring it home, like from Voya and equity markets are looking at U.S. versus international. I'm sure some of that is a stronger dollar uh, call. This is a briefing for those of you with equities, bonds and commodities. Currencies is the deepest market, and Vasilios Giannakis joins us now writing incredibly short, terse strategy for Citigroup. The second derivative is something called convexity. It's fancy talk, FX talk for acceleration. I see lots of convex log curves in foreign exchange. Is it convexity within stability, or are there things unraveling when you look at 42 currency pairs out there? I don't think they're unraveling. It's most likely about um, People having very, very low conviction uh, right now and uh, moving into ranges. And uh, one of the reasons, I think, that uh, people have refrained from the trades that we went through in Q4 and uh, in Q1 has been China. I mean, there's no question about this. The, the, the April data that came out of China were broad, broadly based soft, very soft. Uh, and I think everyone is revising lower global growth expectations. As a matter of fact, there's a very nice chart, which we produce in our latest um, um, uh, piece, in which basically shows you an, an amazing correlation between euro dollar uh, and um, US minus rest of the world global growth expectations for 2023. And you can clearly see, first nine months, it moved in favor of the U.S., euro dollar was going down. Q4, Q1, it moved against the U.S., euro dollar went up. And now it has stabilized and shown signs of spiking in favor of the U.S. So there's definitely some resilience in the U.S. data. Potentially, however, coupled with the understanding by the markets that the Fed may not actually overdo it. And I think that mix there is what is allowing bond yields to go higher, but equally at the same time, equities to stay resilient. There's a really interesting divergence as well within the economic data, both domestically here in the United States and abroad as well in Europe, and in China to some extent too. Services PMI, the data around services is still pretty resilient, robust even. Manufacturing's ugly, almost at recessionary yeah. levels. What do you make of that distinction? So uh, I would say two things in, in that respect. First of all, uh, in general, the uh, manufacturing PMIs uh, all of the, I would say, all of the soft survey data, but predominantly the manufacturing PMIs, have tended to overstate and understate uh, moves in the actual 
uh, data in the economy, in the real GDP growth. The second thing I would say is that we're still facing, I mean, we're not entirely out of the bottleneck woods. Uh, there's still a lot of issues in German uh, production. For example, car manufacturers, when they're being faced with new orders for cars, they take typically right now 16 to 18 months to produce. When, when you're ordering a new car in Europe, it'll take about 16 to 18 months to get delivery of that car. So uh, the, there's definitely an issue there. And the last thing I would say is that, look, uh, the, the economies have reopened from the pandemic. This was largely going to be uh, a services-led recovery. So I would uh, take the deterioration manufacturing with slight pinch of salt, but there is no uh, denying that clearly it's the services that is driving the economy right now. What could cause a breakout in this range, given some of the backdrops and, and sort of the fragilities? In Euro dollar, you mean? Yeah, in, in, in right. Europe. And I think about, for example, when you talk about the delivery times of cars, and I was speaking to a car executive who said a lot of the truck drivers were Ukrainians, and they were conscripted back to Ukraine. Exactly. And so they weren't able to actually transport some exactly. of the parts, which is a huge part exactly. of the problem for industrial production. Exactly. So at what point do some of these stagflationary types of pressures cause something that could be something of a pain trade? Um, well, I think for the euro dollar, the pain trade is going to be for real money accounts uh, to the downside. And what I mean by that is that uh, currently the leverage community hedge funds are pretty much neutral. The real money accounts are long. They're quite long euros, but they initiated these longs around 105. So when you're trading between 107 to 108, they're still okay. They may close some long positions. I think if, which is not my central scenario, but if we gravitate towards 106, there's going to be a lot of angst uh, by asset managers and potentially there's going to be a sizable reduction of longs that could potentially accelerate the move downwards. You said that it's not your base case. What gives you confidence that there is more resilience in a European economy that's yeah, been surprising I'll to the tell, downside yeah. at a pretty quick rate? So uh, I think um, uh, the, a number of things. First of all, the, the external balance for our Eurozone has improved immensely. And that is down to natural gas prices. Uh, by and large, uh, which are now trading around 30 or even below 30 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, so that has created a massive turnaround in the current account balance of euro. And so there is a structural, net positive structural demand for, for euros out there. Uh, and, and that is historically has correlated very well with euro dollar. The other thing which I think is going to play out as a tailwind is clearly the ECB. I think the ECB at 3.7% terminal rate is underpriced. There is a lot of wage growth pressure in the pipeline. Uh, only just in April we had an agreement with uh, 3 million uh, uh, workers from uh, um, uh, public unions agreeing to 7.6%, 7 I think it is, for this year and another 4.5% for next year and others are probably going to want to mimic that so my bottom line is that in contrast to the u.s where inflation shocks transmit relatively quickly into the wages in eurozone they do take time and there is wage growth uh, in the pipeline and the services sector is still strong and there's still excess savings playing into consumers so i think uh, for me uh, the terminal rate should be at least four percent by the ecb we can go to 425 wow. even Wow. Uh, and I think that is going to be an additional tailwind. What I think and what made us mm -hmm. curb our enthusiasm on Europe, on, on Euro dollar, where initially we said it's going to 115 and right now we think it's going to be in a range with a low range around 107, is the fact that the euro now is being deprived by tailwinds from fading Chinese impulses. Uh, help, help us here where we take Euro dollar, dollar yen, we throw them out, we throw the dollar out and then we have Euro yen. It's going to, if it gives way strong euro, weak yen, what's the level that matters or the other way around the collar, strong yen, weak euro? Well, I think resistance is around uh, 150. So we're there. Uh, we're we're uh, now well, right we're, at we're the pretty, cusp of pretty yen much resistance. There. Yeah. I think you're, you're, you're opening up a, a very interesting debate about yen. More about broadly. what and, and, and their monetary policy yeah, or exactly. failure of and, and and this has been in discussion with clients and discussion internally and everyone says it's it's natural uh, almost instinctively you think about yen if you fear about uh, a material slowdown the problem this time around is the carry is painful it's simply 
painful. And every discussion we have had with clients is that they're perfectly happy to play the ranges in dollar, dollar yen, for example, 132, 33, 137, 138, but they don't want to hold on to positioning, betting on a hard landing, for example, because the car is going to kill them before the hard landing materializes. So, um, uh, you know, fundamentally, is yen undervalued? Yes, it's massively undervalued. Uh, is it going to be a safe haven in case of a hard landing? Yes. But do you position uh, in favor of that in cash? No one seems to want to do that right now. Some of that was depressing for Silius. We'll leave it there. It's good to see you. As always, <laughs> for Silius Janak is there. The car city. Something like that. You get a, you get a real window, John, you get a real window into the complexities here, particularly on the yen thing with the monetary sure. theory, yield curve <clears> control, <throat> and how people are like, I just don't have the courage to enter the trade weak yen. Did you have the courage Slam. to buy this? and stick with it, no. NVIDIA, in the pre-market. Let's move right now, session highs. The stock is up by about 27%. Bear in mind that this was a $755 billion name at the close yesterday, so we're adding about 200 billion US to the market cap of this company off the back of just blowout forecasts for revenue, Bramo, and it's driving equity indexes much harder, the S&P, the NASDAQ, and you can see the outperformance versus, say, the Russell, the small caps this morning. It's pretty clear that this is down to one theme. The thing that's mind boggling to me is that these shares have already risen by more than 100% so far this year. The shares have already been on a moonshot. To have one stock trading like a penny stock, although it is one of the biggest market capitalizations in the S&P, in the NASDAQ, tells you exactly where we are in market breath. Dan Ives, Wedbush Publishing, jaw dropping guidance heard around the world. The AI revolution has begun. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence coming up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. With equity futures pushing higher, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The European Union has frozen more than $215 billion in Russian central bank assets since Moscow invaded Ukraine. EU nations reported the new numbers following the bloc's 10 sanctions package, which forced banks to divulge information on the size of their holdings. The EU wants Russia to pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Germany has suffered its first recession since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Europe's biggest economy saw first quarter output shrink 0.3 percent from the previous three months. That followed a half percent drop between October and December. The government says lower household spending on food, clothing, footwear and furnishings was responsible for the weak data. A Chinese state-sponsored hacking group has gained access to infrastructure organizations in Guam and elsewhere in the U.S. That's according to a new report from Microsoft, which says the group is likely trying to disrupt critical communications in the event of a crisis. Microsoft says the hackers, known as Volt Typhoon, have been active since 2021. Guam has become increasingly important military and strategic hub as tensions with China ramp up. Singapore Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong says the widening rift between the U.S. and China appears to be irreconcilable. At a speech at a, at a Nikkei forum in Tokyo, Wong said the situation has become more dangerous amid tensions between the two sides, with the Taiwan Strait becoming the region's most dangerous flashpoint. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. If you look at tech, it continues to reinvent itself over and over. The latest generation is going to be AI. And I think as you look at the visibility of earnings, you, you continue to see a strong uh, earnings coming. And I think that that's important because a lot of people will continue to say that tech has gotten expensive. But when you start to factor in how much tech has been able to beat their earnings, I don't think it's as expensive as what people think. And I think that trend is going to continue. Well, that story is captured by one name this morning. That was Larry Adam of Raymond James. And here is that one name, NVIDIA in the pre-market, absolutely flying, close to 27% higher, 386 in the pre-market. And analysts absolutely loving the guidance from this company. Dan Ives of Wedbush, jaw-dropping guidance heard around the world. The AI revolution has begun. 
A lot of people bring it forward, a ton of demand, a ton of growth for this name. We're talking about a $755 billion stock, potentially adding, Tom, $200 billion US dollars in market cap in today's session. Yeah, and I'm going to go to man deeper in a moment, John, with, the, with I think the key question is, is the addressable uh, market. This stock is up 50% plus per year. This is not a one quarter fluke, a one day fluke, if you will. This is a stock that is delivered and delivered and delivered before this stunning announcement. It's today. up more than 100% this year. Yeah. It's just amazing. It's only May. Not in the triple leveraged all cash fund. You wish. <laughs> Best performing name on the S&P 500. Just absolutely flying. We talk, we speak, we're amateurs. He's not. Mandeep Singh joins us now, senior technology NVIDIA analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence for a really important conversation. I got a bunch of questions, Mandy, but let me just simply yeah. start with the addressable market out there over the next decade. There's been some pretty good work on this. Is it like the cloud where it seems never ending for NVIDIA excellence? I think so. And what they have done really well is they have gone beyond this narrative of, you know, NVIDIA being just a chip company. And they have actually proved it in the way they have gone about their product launches. So now they have been partnering with the hyperscalers, especially Microsoft, and it's an application that sits on top of Microsoft Cloud, which is how you consume generative AI. And I would say the addressable market for that is uh, north of trillion dollars, simply because when you look at how these services are deployed, the underlying infrastructure, that will become a much bigger portion of overall IT spending. So. Whether the hyperscalers let NVIDIA kind of continue with that, I am doubtful. I don't think AWS is on board with that strategy or Google is, but Microsoft definitely is, and that is what is working for them in terms of that cloud play. Mandeep, what was amazing about yesterday in the guidance was the timeline. It was the fact that this demand seemed to have already appeared in their outlook, in their near-term outlook for the current quarter and beyond. Mandeep, have you got a sense for where this has come from? how they're able to monetize it right now. Yeah, and, and I think what is very clear right now is Intel has given up its leadership when it comes to being the primary chip at, at the data center level. So CPUs used to be you know, the main chip that you would need to run a server. Guess what? Going forward, you're going to need a lot more of NVIDIA GPUs. And NVIDIA has bundled their networking, GPUs, switches, all in one package, which is the beauty of how you consume things on cloud. So clearly that shift from CPUs to GPUs is very visible right now in terms of the trend, and that is sustainable. That is not going away anytime soon. But to build on what John was talking about, the company's forecast for sales during the forward-looking period was 53% higher than analyst estimates. Where did the surprise come from? Well, so that is a real surprise in terms of what they saw 90 days back versus uh, last night. And clearly, I think the generative AI wave is catching up. Everyone right now wants to invest in this. So uh, the other aspect of it is the supply side. Last year, we were in a supply crunch situation where NVIDIA was one of the vendors that was going to TSMC. Now that supply has normalized, they can make a lot more of these and they can satisfy that insatiable demand on the data center side. So I do think the supply uh, easing, supply chain easing is helping them and it's visible in their gross margin. The gross margin is close to 70% for next quarter. That's like a software-like margin and you're seeing that gross margin expansion on the back of very high demand, which is a, a very good sign when it comes to fundamentals. I hate being negative, Nelly, but I do wonder where China plays into this, especially as there are certain bans being placed, or at least restraints, on what U.S. or non-Chinese companies can sell to China with respect to highly capable uh, chip technology. So at what point does that become a headwind or sort of an unknown that challenges some of the absolute runaway valuations of NVIDIA? Yeah, so you bring up a great point. It happened to Micron this week. And uh, right now there are export controls around NVIDIA chips. And uh, to my mind, they are actually still under shipping demand on the data center side. So the demand is actually higher, which is somewhat reflected in the guide now. But still, I, I think if the China market is huge for them, and if you know the export controls were to increase, that would certainly hurt them, but I, I don't think NVIDIA is the only company that gets hurt in that scenario. Mandy, they're out 12 months at a 50 times earning. It's really not all that big of a peopled company, 70,000, whatever the, the employment is. Maybe they're not a takeout candidate, 
But why doesn't big money come in and take out 10 or 15 percent of this is a stub out five years or 10 years? It just makes to me it's it's a no brainer. Yeah, well, I, I think part of it has to do with just uh, how the market is positioned right now. There are certain pockets that are uh, in high demand because of the AI wave. And then there are certain segments in, on the semi side which are uh, in, in a mode where they are I I inventory clearing and, and that sort of thing. So clearly uh, you will see a rebound across different chip segments at different times. And right now it's anything to do with generative AI that is doing well. And, and there's a good reason for that, I think in terms of a transformative aspect. Mandy, can we just finish on where Tom started basically, essentially, how do you value some of these companies at the moment? Look, I, I think for a stock like NVIDIA, a lot is priced in. It was priced for perfection last night too. But then when you deliver this kind of beat, it's hard to be negative simply because, you know, there's, as I said, there's still under shipping demand on the data center side and the data center business will double in the next two years. So it will grow into its valuation. But any slight miss, and we have seen that only with semi companies, they can have a big a beat like this, a monster beat, or they can miss big as well. And, and I don't think it's going to happen to NVIDIA in the next couple of quarters. But that is always a risk. If the hyperscalers were to develop their own chips, their customer base is concentrated. I mean, it's three customers that's buying 50% of their chips, you know, the hyperscale cloud customers. So if they decide to uh, make their own chips or even, uh, you know, anything along those lines, that will hurt the stock. Just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Mandeep, thank you. Mandeep Singh there of Bloomberg Intelligence on the back of the success of NVIDIA, a stock we were waiting to deliver earnings yesterday and this call, the guidance, just absolutely amazing. The stock is flying in the pre-market right now, up by about 26, 27 percent. Looking at what's happening in equity futures off the back of it on the S&P 500, up by 0.6 percent. The Nasdaq 100, as you might expect. Lisa, that's flying too, going into the opening bell a few hours away. I love what Mandeep just said there. They were priced to perfection last night. So what did they deliver? Better than perfection. Incredible news. And basically, it seems like buy first, justify later is the way to go with a lot of these technology I, shares. You know, I have an AMD Radeon in my studio at home. And that's sort of more basic, more friendly. NVIDIA is way more fancy and high powered. And if I'm these big companies, Apple, Microsoft, name, Mandeep knows the names better than me, how can you not buy a 10 or 15 percent position in this company, even at 50 or 60 times earnings, to get out three or four years in this AI belief, if you really believe in it? Uh, that 10 percent position will cost about 100 billion uh, uh, oh, yeah, by the end you of the know, day. Well, you <laughs> go do, come Potentially. on, John, Potentially. you go do a bond <laughs> offering and BlackRock ends up owning the transaction. But the, the bottom line is they own the high ground. How can you how can Warren Buffet not climb on board? To John's point. Potentially, this will be the biggest one-day move in market capitalization in history. The previous record was set by Apple with a one-day move of $191 billion of market capitalization. This could potentially just blow that out of the water. How do you make big moves at something that's already valued at an incredible rate? Well, we have no clue. It is throwing a dart at the dartboard, especially, as Mandeep said, they can beat by big and they can miss by big in a very quickly moving universe. Can you tell us more about this studio? We all want to know. It's what a Mac you Pro. Once you, no, you drop no, in, you've got a studio. Is, What's the studio? This is this wonder stuff that okay. they have. I have a Mac Pro, which is a cheese grater computer, big fancy beast. Right, this is the music something, studio. Yeah, something I would okay. never, ever have imagined opening, uh, owning five years ago, let alone 30 years ago. And the answer is you put this stuff into it. And there's a black box, which is an AMD Radeon thing you put in. Mm. That's competing with NVIDIA. And does every song you create have this soundtrack to it? No, the, it like, does. like Bloomberg surveillance oh, yeah. music? At yeah, the end. You know. yeah, dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. You've got a recording studio at home now. Yeah. yeah. Really? I've had one for years. It's just this one's fancier than I've got to renegotiate my one. contract here. Recording studio at home. What would you yeah, do? Yeah, it's a walk. You'd have, like, <laughs> lambs or goats. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you'd... I'd retire. <laughs>
The retail stock activity has been dreadful. Over the last four or five months, people have been so underinvested, lack of conviction, they just still need to put some money to work. I think investors should be a bit cautious here. The market still believes that the Fed is going to have to cut before the end of the year. The only way the Fed actually cuts rates this year is if there is a recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. We've got some big moves to talk about. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brabbitts. I'm Jonathan Farrow. NVIDIA absolutely flying up by 27% in the pre-market and in close to 200 billion US dollars to its market cap. Tom, just a blowout guidance from that company. We did what we do. We talked to an expert. Mandeep Singh made real clear this is uh, uh, an industry that can aggregate out over two years, five years, ten years in, in more. So, you know, I would suggest that NVIDIA uh, is a huge story, but then how does it roll over to its customers? How does it roll over to its competitors like AMD? I mean, shock is the only word that matters. Oh, the FOMO after the close yesterday in this name, Bramo, as those numbers started to pour out of the executives' mouths on what the future might look like. Well, I like that you mentioned FOMO because we're in this universe where we're supposed to be in recession, we're not. We're supposed to be heading into something really traumatic. I don't know. The Fed is supposed to be killing all of the demand for big tech. And all of a sudden, people can't get enough. And there's this FOMO that's trading, uh, that's causing these yeah. huge mega tech names to trade like penny stocks. What does that okay. tell you? What it tells about me, we're, this we're is at? really important into a long weekend. Really, really important. 24 hours ago, we were worried that China was going to fall into the Pacific Ocean and all of tech would die. It's a general generalization. We're, we're down in Quite a generalization. Giannakis yeah. of Citigroup. <laughs> No, Giannakis of Citigroup is brilliant on this. There's no conviction, John. We're going from story to story. NVIDIA at least seems to be a true tangible growth story around a hugely debatable thing. AI, I don't know what it is, but generative AI is what they do. And I guess there's a belief in it. Look at the numbers. They speak for themselves. Oh, Tom, go out now and survey people. Are we on the brink of a mount up or a mount down? You'll have people just stuck in between doing exactly what you just did. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. In the meantime, whilst you're holding your hands up and saying, I don't vote. know, you've got the Nasdaq, what up, by 30% year to date now off the back of some of this? And this one single name at more than 100%. And Goldman Sachs really tracked the fact that mutual funds, active mutual funds, have really lagged behind their index because they weren't invested heavily enough in big tech. Everyone was talking about big no, tech falling out of bed. Don't All of a sudden going. now, talk about FOMO. They're underperforming at a greater than uh, usual pace. And... Do they buy NVIDIA now after oh. it's a moonshot and it's been I added? I mean, come on. The, look, look at the calendars. We're going to June. we got the whole debt thing to worry about. Maybe we'll talk about that in the next three hours. Guess what? June 30, someone like Phil Camperell, they have to start writing their mid-year review yeah, feel sorry about June 10th. <laughs> we'll have a moment of silence for that in a moment. Those with us around the table. Consensus <clears throat> positions everywhere getting eaten alive. Tech so far year to date, the dollar with the euro coming back to 107, the rate cut calls, the two year yield tie for 10 straight sessions. What's left to beat up? Oh, pretty much, if you have faith in it, then it will probably rip your face off. I mean, that's basically what people are saying, which is a reason why you have this sort of dissonance between people saying, you know, buy it. You've got Savita Subramanian saying, you know, everyone's just looking to put cash to work. <clears throat> and then you have uh, the other side of the, the, the scale, uh, Daryl uh, Darryl Crump coming out and basically saying, Look, don't jump on the train at the very end. Equity futures right now, just about positive on the S&P 500. Here's the stage. This is how it's set going into the open and bell about two hours and 30 minutes away. Equities up in a bond market yield to look like this. Yields up by two basis points on a 10-year Bramo, 376. We're going to be uh, getting some economic data today. 8.30 a.m., we get initial jobless claims followed by pending home sales for April at 10 a.m. Later in the day, also, we get information on how much banks are continuing to borrow from the Federal Reserve Emergency Lending Facility. Jobless claims key here to understand whether uh, they really are more abound and we have an incredibly strong economy or whether cracks are starting to form. We are getting retail earnings. We just did get Best Buy. Shares flying up more than 4%. Seems like a nothing move compared to NVIDIA. Uh, but they beat expectations. They beat their earnings per share. And they're getting rewarded even after a pretty significant move year to date in uh, retailers. Later after the bell, we get Costco and Gap. And today, FedSpeak includes Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin at 9.50 and Boston Fed President Susan Collins at 10.30 a.m. who will give a discourse on artificial intelligence. No, she will not. She will be talking about Fed policy. <laughs> she might be asked about it. <laughs> she might. Phil Camperetti is going to be asked about it. He joins us now from J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Phil, good morning to good you. Good morning. Are we on the brink of a mount up or a mount down? 
Yeah, so I'll tell you where NVIDIA isn't in the $700 billion of money market mutual fund purchases that have been made this year. U.S. equity f demand flows are, are down $58 billion this year. So we're talking about a, a story here where folks came into the year thinking, oh, my goodness, here comes the recession. The Fed has to cut. That is not happening. If you're expecting a Fed rate cut, you're expecting a, a traumatic event. You're expecting a, a recession. You're expecting a regional bank story. And that's not what we're expecting here. So I think it's really hard, John, to be underweight equity in this environment. We're just trying to make diversification great again, right? So after 2022, where there was nowhere to hide, what we're saying here is let the data do the work. Let the economic data do the work for you. And if we go into this kind of soft landing scenario, which we expect, you do not want to be underweight equity in this environment. And that's not where the flows are going, because the flows are going into cash. And I would say cash is our biggest competitor right now. What does diversification look like when big yep. tech is trading like petty stocks? Yeah, good question. You don't want to be underweight the S&P 500. So I, I'm not going to make a bet here that, you know, it's growth over value or whatever, Lisa. What we're saying here is find the quality in the market, find the earnings in the market. So when we came into this year, we were saying, okay, how do we find companies that don't necessarily need a regional bank loan, for example? Okay, so we're trying to find companies that are that are that are high free cash flow, high quality. And Lisa, that is part of the story of what's working this year. Okay, that's a great story. Yeah. Love it. A lot of people are yeah. saying it. How do you know what quality is? Is NVIDIA quality? Is that a reliable market capitalization? Sure, they've got revenues, mm -hmm. but does their valuation really get justified by the potential that is really unforeseeable? Sure, it's, but at least it's emblematic of the story that we're going for. So we're not saying go buy NVIDIA here. What we're saying is go find the companies that we think can outlast tighter financial conditions, which there's no way in our opinion that the Fed is going to be easing financial conditions anytime soon with companies like Delta coming out and saying, we have record advanced bookings this summer to fly. Okay, record advanced bookings. So the consumer is there. As John said, NASDAQ up 20%. There's no way the Fed's easing if the Nasdaq's up 20 percent, right? So these are all the things that we're that we're thinking about. But again, you cannot be underweight stocks here in an environment where where the soft landing scenario for us looks more appropriate than the hard landing. The only time that right. you can get a hard landing is if inflation <laughs> accelerates from here and the Fed has to take the federal funds rate up through six or six and a half percent. Not right. a zero probability event, but a but a but a but a low probability event for us. Here. Gospel at four in which led on this, truly led yes. on this, folks, over 50 Stevie years. Wonder, commencement speaker. Really? Year. Yes. I did not know that. Yes. Very, That's and he very sang. cool. Very, very cool. cool. Love very that. Cool. <laughs> the, the thing that I would note is we're all resetting our terminal rate. We've got mm -hmm. these wonder stocks trading at 30, 40, 50 times forward volume. I mean, it's enough to make someone nauseous. And the only solution is to extend out your terminal rate, extend out your horizon. Mm -hmm. How are you handling that at J.P. Morgan now? Yeah, so are you referring to the terminal rate, the, the, the federal funds rate? I'm looking out three years. I'm looking out seven years. Yeah. All of a sudden, I'm looking out four or five years, or dare I say nine years out, mm -hmm. to justify ownership. Yeah, so th listen, the, 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 the rate that we're expecting, okay, is – you know, five, five and a quarter percent on the federal funds rate at the end of this year. But longer term, Tom, we have about a two and a quarter percent federal funds fair value, three and a quarter on the 10 year treasury. So when Lisa asks what's diversification, that's a bond story. Tom, at the end of the day, because you now have the benefit of duration at your at your back. So over the next decade, that's a really important story. Does that duration benefit tech? Uh, yes, it benefits long duration equity, no growth for growth. We have a trend growth rate in the U.S. of about 2%, which puts a fair value on growth higher than where it is today. Mm. And that's an important theme here. We have the, our 60-40 portfolio at its best forecast of 7% since 2010. You add some alpha on top of that with security selection or tactical asset allocation, you're talking about a 9% achievable rate on a balanced fund over the next decade. That's what last year did. Bad news is last year. Good news is what we're launching off for, for now. So Lisa brought up the diversification question a couple of times. I yeah. want to finish on that. Yeah, sure. Am I going to get risk mitigation qualities from treasuries? Because at the moment, things a little bit look a little bit difficult down yep. in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and Treasuries aren't rallying. They're selling off right. for 10 straight sessions to the right. front end. What is that? Right. That's pricing out what we thought was premature easing. So okay. that's kind of like near-term indigestion. The next move, we think the earliest it could be 
is 2024 is most likely going to be an ease, which is why I say, Tom, cash is our biggest competitor because people think it's a 5% risk-free rate and that's what I'm going to get. Reinvestment risk is real. But at the end of the day, Tom, treasuries are going to protect you in the soft landing scenario or the hard landing scenario, obviously. But the soft landing scenario is inflation falls faster than growth and treasuries are going are gonna to rally in that scenario. But that's not today's trade. Today's trade, do not be underweight equities in an environment where the consumer is still very, very strong as we head into this summer. Phil, great to catch up. Great. Good to see you, mate. Phil Camperati there of JP Morgan Asset Management with some big moves in this market right now. Looking at the front end of the yield curve, the two-year, 442, looking at one name of the pre-market, NVIDIA, flying by more than 20 Seven percent. I'm reliably informed that 32.4 percent higher will get us to that magic number, a one trillion dollar market cap, Lisa, for this name. That's insane. Can I just say that a one day move like that on such a big stock, this would be the biggest ever. Oh. I just keep repeating this: the biggest ever one day increase in market capitalization in U.S. history, if it holds. And I would note that off the shock of yesterday afternoon, it's. It hasn't pulled back. I mean, it's steaming on through the late night and the pre-market, John, is up, up, up. There's there a trend were here. two shockers yesterday yeah. afternoon. This was one. There was another playing out almost simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Did you tune in for Twitter Spaces yesterday with Elon Musk? No, I didn't because I don't know how to use Spaces. I've clicked on it, okay, I think, once or twice out. before, but I hear it really... I was kicked off was the app uh, about ten times in the Embrama. Did you try this? I, I gave up. I gave up. I, just wasn't working out. I think Do you think they up. would have known that up front? I mean, it's just like there's 200,000 people, and you say, okay, if 200,000 people show up, what happens? Somebody must have known. I said yesterday that often we forget how campaign started. I don't think people will forget this one <laughs> in a rush. Yeah. I will say at one point, though, I felt like it was so bad it was good because so many people would wake up and talk about this one thing. The Governor DeSantis presidential launch campaign did not launch. It was preparing to launch on Twitter with Elon Musk for ages. Then Team Trump came out and said something like failure to launch. And then you had the likes of Biden's administration, Joe Biden coming out on Twitter and coming out and saying basically this link works. I know. And it linked it to his amazing. campaign. Amory Horton got on. The response on. is amazing. Amory Horton got on like no problem. She was on. She was listening to it. It was all Twitter spaces. AMH is going to join us in a moment. Looking forward to that conversation as the <coughs> governor of Florida gets into the race. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ukraine is gearing up to begin its anticipated counteroffensive as it soon as soon as it receives the necessary weapons and equipment from allies. That today from a top advisor to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. He spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. We will further be preparing the counteroffensive. And as soon as we will be ready with the support of our partners who are delivering us and continue to deliver us. Uh, high-level artillery, uh, uh, enough ammunition, uh, battle tanks, and uh, uh, armored vehicles. As soon as we get it, we'll start this counteroffensive, and definitely it will be resolved. Jovka also dismissed Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban's statement that Ukraine can't win the war with Russia. Pressure is mounting on British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on news that migration to the UK surged to a record last year. According to the Office for National Statistics, an estimated 606,000 more people moved to the UK than left. Now that's up from 488,000 the previous year. Sunak has pledged to limit the flow. And Tina Turner, widely known as the queen of rock and roll, has died, age 83. The Grammy Award-winning singer was known for her hyper-energetic dance moves. Her fame took off in the mid-80s as a solo performer, selling out massive stadiums. Mick Jagger paid tribute, calling her warm, funny, and generous, as well as being an enormously talented performer. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. They want to spend $30 billion more than they spent this year. I, I've been very clear. I will not put a bill on the floor that spends more money next year than this year. House Republicans are determined to either extract deep, painful cuts that will hurt the health, the safety, or the well-being of everyday Americans or crash the economy. 
That's my Norwich leader, Hakeem Jeffries. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy speaking to Fox News as this deal and these debt ceiling talks go absolutely nowhere anytime soon. In the equity market, off the back of all of this, no sign of any worries right now. Your S&P 500 positive by 0.56%, a lift off the back of this run, this surge in this single name, surge. NVIDIA up by 27%. I think you can call it a surge, Tom, when yep. the market cap's 755 Fair. billion and you're adding 200, <laughs> 200 billion more, at least totally in early agree. trading. I mean, honestly, this is just a moonshot. Again, though, what does this say about FOMO, as you mentioned, John, earlier? Does this mean that basically people are more scared of missing out at this point than the I, catastrophe I think the this goes beyond that, that everyone was talking I, I about? I don't think it's a trading mentality at all. It is a strategic reality. The technology is just killing it. And I'm fascinated, John. You mentioned NASDAQ up 1.84%. How do those other 20 stocks do that drive the NASDAQ 100? I, I, I really wonder. The psychology of all of this is always, always really interesting because you do get caught. If you're not in this, you're sitting there wondering, do I need to get in this, mount up or mount down? Remember that quote from Michael Hahn of Bank of America just last week? It would be so on brand for stocks to melt up into the recession, suck them all right in before the hard landing. And, Tom, that's what people will be nervous about. At the same time, they'll be looking back to certain themes that they missed out on and they'll be seeing, thinking, well, I've heard these doubters before. I've heard these bears and maybe this is really the next big thing and I need to be allocated. That's how some I, people will wake up feeling t today, Tom, <clears throat> off the back of a move like I, that. I, I, I strong, yeah, I, I strongly agree, and I think we'll just have to see how it opens up and really listen to people like Mandeep Singh, Anurag Rana, uh, and the rest as well. Right now, Amory Horton with us, Bloomberg Washington Nationals correspondent. She'll be at the 405 start today with the San Diego Padres because she knows serious conversation <laughs> in Washington happens at the ballpark or over a three-day weekend. All my radars up, Amory. They got a long weekend to come to Jesus. Where's the debt talks <laughs> yeah. going to be Tuesday morning? A long weekend ahead, and Republicans, um, the House members, are going to be leaving town. So what potentially people are starting to think about is because Speaker McCarthy said that we could potentially see a deal in principle over the weekend um, come together by this weekend— Maybe this is a chance they could get something before the weekend because Speaker McCarthy is going to be giving the House 72 hours to review it and then come back and vote. Um, this would be obviously a positive development in the debt negotiations. Potentially what happened last night with Fitch putting the U.S. on ratings watch mm, right. maybe is the final impetus to really make sure these individuals are getting in the room and hammering it out. But it is starting to look more positive. But I am a little bit jaded because last weekend when I was in Japan, there was also this hope that when the president landed and he was with Speaker McCarthy, that would be like the final version of this and they would have a deal in principle. Um, so a lot has to be wait to be seen. I was told by a White House source that they would be still meeting every single day. Let's see if they meet today. And, of course, let's see what they do before the weekend. The Washington Post leads with Democratic Party unrest. They're upset with the White House. They're getting it wrong. I would assume that's pretty much a natural feeling. But color that idea of what liberals in the Democrat Party think about what their leader's doing in the White House. Well, we need to see what's in the final agreement. But what many progressives are concerned about is that the White House would be giving away too much to get this deal over the finish line. But clearly for the White House, what would be catastrophic and the worst thing would be if there actually was a default. Um, and clearly they were feeling the heat. They said they wouldn't negotiate about the debt ceiling. They clearly are negotiating about the debt ceiling or at least negotiating the spending to lift the debt ceiling. So, um, yeah, I guess they're looking at, you know, what are the worst what are the worst outcomes and negotiating and lifting the debt ceiling looks much better in their eyes and annoying progressives than potentially a catastrophic default on the president of the United States watch who is running for re-election in 2024. Perhaps the story that's getting more uh, discussion in Washington, D.C. right now is what happened last night with Ron DeSantis on Twitter. This is just a line from a Guardian story written about this. Once people had gotten beyond the what is Twitter spaces stage, they were greeted with blank windows, broken snatches of conversation and other technical glitches. How big of a potential liability is this for Ron DeSantis, given some of the memes out there, some of the mockery from other candidates? Is this just something where no publicity is bad publicity, as John was alluding to before? 
Well, I think the news cycle is very quick. So potentially we'll be talking about this exact moment next week. Probably not. But what is telling is that the morning after this highly uh, watched candidate made his announcement 26 minutes late because of these technical glitches, we are actually talking about the event failure rather than what the governor said and how the governor wants to run a presidential campaign. This is what stuck out for me from the New York Times scathing. Executive competence, core to the DeSantis campaign messages, was conspicuously absent. The event mounted, amounted to hard confirmation, a zeitgeizy exercise, devolving instead into a conference call from hell. So this is what this is how the media is picking this up, and this is how also his challengers, like the former president, are picking this up. They're calling this a failure, um, but. We have to see how he does in the next few weeks. They are highly predictable takes. I'll tell you what this reminded me of. Do you remember the Cybertruck? And they said bulletproof windows. And they threw a rock through it. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Do you remember the following day? Yeah. Disaster. Terrible. Do you know what the order book is for the Cybertruck? That's a good point. Yeah, I don't know the order book, but it's massive. Uh, more than a million. More than a million based on some of the reporting that I've seen. Do you think this makes a difference? I don't know. This is pretty bad. I mean, no, maybe, my not. View is, maybe not. <laughs> my view is this morning that the people who were never going to talk about this are now talking about it. And they like to talk well, about it because in their minds it failed. Like the media takes this morning is so predictable off the back of what happened. The fact is we're all right. talking about it and they'll all be talking about him. And Governor DeSantis now is going <clears> to go <throat> around and do a bunch of interviews with some big networks. And they're the things you'll be focused on, the substance, the things he's got to say. And more and more people will get to know him and they'll get to decide if they want to buy <clears throat> a cyber truck, and you'll forget that the bullet, the bulletproof right. windows weren't bulletproof on the day it launched. It's a good point. Emory Horton, I got one quick question here. We're running out of time, but but help me here. I think the governor of Florida is anti woke. I think the former <laughs> president is anti woke. Is there a distinction in their anti wokeness? This is something that the governor said multiple times last night, at least the moments I was able to log on and tune into this Twitter spaces about going after the woke campaign. Uh, what the DeSantis team really tries to establish is that they are a more uh, trusted version of the Trump world. It's Trump without the drama. And you continu continuously hear them really okay. try to reiterate that message because they don't want to lose that base that core that Trump has been building up. They want to be the next Trump, but what he tries to say is without the drama to make sure he can also have those big donors, which, by the way, we should note yesterday within an hour uh, what the fundraising brought in after that campaign event was about a million dollars. That's pretty standard, but the likes of Steve Schwartzman, the founder of Interactive Brokers, these individuals at the moment are on pause with DeSantis. So I think the next few weeks will be very telling. AMH, thank you. I'm Marie Hordan. Very brief. Down in DC. <clears throat> I tell you, you can see how seriously that his competitors are taking this run. The fact that you had the campaign of the president, the campaign of the former president, all taking shots as this was playing out in the last 12 hours tells you how highly they regard this potential competitor in this race. I actually think your take is, is really uh, well taken in the sense that, yes, there is this debacle. However, there is suddenly a whole host of attention and it will continue to be on him as people can't get enough of a train wreck. Kathy Jones, a Charles Schwab, joining us very shortly on a fixed income market. And this ain't a train wreck, that's for sure. And video in the free market if you're just tuning in. <laughs> Amazing segue. And you hold it. Congratulations. The stock is up <laughs> by almost 28% from New York. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning. Good morning to NVIDIA in the pre-market, higher by 28%. New session high for that name, absolutely flying. Lisa's going to build on that in just a moment. This is what it means for equity futures. They're flying too on the NASDAQ 100, up by 1.9%, adding to the gain so far this year. The Nasdaq, of course, with a 5 to 6% weighting for NVIDIA, which explains why you've got this move on the Nasdaq 100. This is going to breathe some life into the other <coughs> AI themes out there as well, which don't belong, of course, on the small caps, the Russells, which is why you've got the underperformance in the Russell right now of negative 0.4%. As I say, the equity story, we'll build on that in just a moment. I want to sit on the bond market for a second as well. I can't believe how little this has been talked about. 
for 10 straight sessions, yields have been climbing higher at the front end. We're up by five basis points now in today's session on twos. So we've gone 50 basis points higher, Tom. 50 basis for points higher in 10 days. X sessions, I mean, John slides in the door at 552, but I get in a little earlier, and the 10 charts I look at are the same thing, John, as a two-year yield. Three-month LIBOR, up X number of days in a row, out to a new uh, high this morning. The 30-year mortgage popped yesterday way above a 7.04. It's not through to the new highs, but that two-year yield observation, which I totally agree with you on, goes over to all sorts of other yield studies. And spills out into other asset classes as well. So you've got yeah. this story of high yields eating into the rate cut story in the near term, breathing some life into the US dollar again. And this is the move. This currency pair against the euro has come down from pushing 111 all the way down to about 107 this morning. The lower the session, Lisa, 107.14. Right now, 10728 if it's hard to get macro themes, it's just as hard to get micro themes sometimes. And I think that that's what some of the share price moves that we've gotten today really highlight. You were talking about NVIDIA, John, and honestly, this share move might be the biggest in terms of an increase in market capitalization in U.S. history if it holds at these kinds of levels, surging 28 percent. We've talked about it all morning. The key question here is, do we have a sense of how many people are flooding back in after having missed it all of this year? Is this a moment of FOMO? Best by also a winner, up uh, almost 5% after beating expectations. Their first quarter adjusted earnings per share, 115 versus the 111 estimate. So again, a pretty big move. But there also are losers. And what the losers highlight to me, particularly with Snowflake, is that even within an industry, it is hard to make an accurate prediction. Snowflake has software tied to cloud computing. And it cut its guidance. So you see those shares down more than 13%. Cloud computing related to AI. And yet still not necessarily getting traction. American Eagle down more than 18 percent after uh, cutting full year forecasts. To me, again, the retail segment, you have the haves That's and the have-nots. But this is, to me, a really interesting moment where people cannot get a handle on the narrative. And that's why you're seeing such big share moves. Dollar Tree coming out, I do want to just say this because they're just coming out. What I find interesting here, those shares down more than 11 percent after they missed expectations. This is because of margin compression. Their margins were lower. Sales increased, margins lower. Again, we saw this during the pandemic where inflation was really crimping some of the lower end kind of uh, discounters simply because they did not have the capability to offset it with price increases. <clears throat> Tell me a story. I'll validate it with a retailer right now. Whatever the story might be, you can find a name, can't you? But that's exactly the point, right? So if you're having trouble understanding the macro, Good luck with the micro, because it basically confirms anything and everything, depending on which one you pick. Good luck setting policy. We had Fed minutes <laughs> yesterday. More Fed speak today. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin. Boston Fed President Susan Collins. Coming up a little bit later, Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab has this to say on the Fed speak at the moment. Dallas Fed President Logan compared navigating the current need for tighter policy with the risk of financial instability to driving down a foggy road. My concern is that the Fed is trying to do this with one foot on the brake and the other on the gas. It seems like we could be in, Tom, for a very bumpy ride, yeah. if that's the case. And then this is a study to the end of the quarter, June 30, I, I would say, is a study of what to do with QT. This is percolating out there in the zeitgeist. Is okay, what do you believe about QT? What should you do about Q QT? Joining us right now, Kathy Jones with all sorts of good work, including a dual piano from Eastman and Juilliard as well. Wonderful to have you here. Uh, today, you emphasize something I'm very comfortable with, which is a barbell strategy given the Fed uncertainty John just uh, pointed out as well. Describe what a barbell is and where the best barbell to lift is right now. So um, barbell is just dividing the maturities of your holdings between you know, short and intermediate to long. And one reason we think a barbell makes sense right now, certainly tactically, is that you, you have a lot of pressure, uh, obviously, on very short-term rates. You get a lot of yield there. Um, that gives you some, some uh, optionality with what to do in reinvesting. If you skip that you know, two-, three-year area that's priced for the Fed to cut, um, that's where you're probably vulnerable to a, a repricing if the Fed doesn't cut. And so, but then we want to go out longer because we still believe the narrative that oh, well. the economy is going to slow and inflation is going to come down. So it's kind of a, a tactical way to, to kind of work in this environment. 
Yeah, she did that. She didn't give me how long out. Do I go out to five years or do I go out to 30 years? Oh. Uh, 30 or two, a, a two's, 30s barbell? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> no. No 30s. Um, <laughs> I would say, you know, you could, do, you could do up to two, maybe actually a little bit less, uh, stay more cash-like at the short end. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Just, five to seven, five to ten. This is real bond talk about laddering sure. out over risk of reinvestment. If you give me 60 Serious seconds, math. I'm going to do something to wind you up. Fed minutes yesterday. Wait for this. All right. Skip. Quote. Several participants noted that if the economy evolved along the lines of their current outlooks, then further policy firming after this may not be necessary. Some participants commented <laughs> that based on their expectations that progress in returning inflation to 2 percent could continue to be unacceptably slow. Additional policy firming would likely be warranted at future meetings. Please go on. I'm going to stop. <laughs> Is some more than several? <laughs> What's going on over there? I don't know. Um, obviously, there's a range of opinions. I guess that's a, what, what we can say. I think that, but this does differ from the last couple of times when everybody was kind of on board with the anti inflation narrative. We didn't hear a lot about, um, you know, some or a few concerned about the lagged impact of tightening to date. Now we're starting to hear that narrative. So it sounds to me like there, there's a lot of people on the fence right now. Well, let's say no action in June. Would your base case be the next move would be a cut or a hike? Um, I, I think they'd probably try to hold all year, but then next year start to, to cut. Interesting. What? Go on, Bramah. No, right now we're seeing uh, this issue where July is becoming increasingly live. And this is different. And, John, this is to your point. You were saying it's the next move, a cut or a hike. But right now people had been saying a cut. Now they're saying a hike. Is there a corollary for this level of, of volatility? You could drive yourself nuts with all of this. I am. I get the sense now that you could come to some kind of compromise on the committee in the June meeting and say, let's skip June, let's get some additional information and make a call on July. And I think you might have some calls out there from people who say June, they'll probably skip. July, they're going to hike again. Now, the Hawks out there, the Hawks, if you can call them that, they're behind that idea, I think. I think they're willing to make that compromise. But this will come down to two things now. In fact, three. June 2nd payrolls, June 13th CPI, and let's see what happens with this debt ceiling mess. I can't imagine you get a rate hike if we're still trying to negotiate a debt ceiling mess and things get really dicey. What do you think we'd need to see June 2nd, June 13th to really put that hike back on the table and convince the several who think perhaps we should stop that maybe they need to go again? Oh, I think it would come down to the size of the payroll increase, particularly, say, service sector payrolls, and then um, average hourly earnings. And um, you have to couple that with the work week. Uh, so what we've seen is the work week has slowed down, and that means that aggregate income starts to slow down. So even if wages are climbing, if people are getting fewer hours, that means writ large aggregate, aggregate income is coming down. So I think they'll try to parse that pretty carefully. Um, but I think you'd have to see a pretty big payroll number, um, you know, above 250 again with some rising wages and then a, a bad CPI number. That would probably put us back in the hike area. How hard is it for the Fed to communicate not moving, not being necessarily indicative of rate cuts later in the year? Yeah, I think that you could see that in the minutes and you can hear that in their comments, very determined to say this is just a momentary pause, um, not a pivot, uh, not a change in direction, just we're on hold for the moment waiting to see. And I think they've really worked hard to communicate that and the market's reflecting that. Do you think that they have been successful in their communication and in a cohesive strategy that the market's understanding? I think it's been a mixed bag, uh, to put it uh, nicely. I think communication has been fraught with a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of reflecting a lot of different views. And maybe that's fine. You know, maybe that's the whole point to get a lot of different views out there. Mm -hmm. But the volatility that we see at the short end reflects the fact, I think, that it's not clear to the market on a day to day basis where the Fed is coming from. I, I am at Schwab. I'm down in Fort Worth for the Charles Schwab challenge the great colonial golf tournament and i've got cash i walk in the door today where's my most efficacious real yield my most efficacious inflation adjusted yield well when you're looking at say five year treasuries or so when i look at the tips break evens um, or the two years, um, you know, you got real yields are, are climbing. Well, really, they're, yields climbing. Are, they're climbing pretty fast. And so, you know, if you look at, say, tips as a way to get real, to if lock you get in over 150 yield, on a 10 year real yield, what does that signal to you? 
Yeah, I think that's a pretty good deal. Now, it could, could go higher, but I think if you can lock in a real yield and have that nominal yield mm -hmm. adjusted for CPI, it's not a bad deal. You were on Friday for John's The Real Yield? Friday afternoon? It's not John's anymore. <laughs> it's not John's I, I anymore. I heard you doing it Friday. <laughs> Am I? I haven't been told about that. Going into Memorial Day weekend. That was always a tough booking back in the day. Getting people to come in on Kathy, 1 p.m. What are you doing time. Memorial Day weekend Friday? <laughs> that was come always on. tough. That was so difficult. Yes. Yeah. I was always angling to get out, get out the office. Yeah. You know, that cough starts to come. Not that I would ever do that. <laughs> Never done that. <laughs> Kathy, thank you. Kathy yes, Judge, wonderful. the charge as well. Well, that was great in COVID, wasn't it? Because, <clears> you know, just that one cough and it oh, was yeah, like, yeah. whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stay, away, stay away from me. Get out of the building. Yeah, yeah. And now it's like, get to work. Can I, can Don't I you say... dare do a test. <laughs> Dan, can I sell something? You know that's happening at companies, oh, right? 100% that's happening. Don't you dare do a test. Exactly. If you do just a test, tell me. you're out for five days. <laughs> I do not want to know. I'm not saying that happens here. I'm saying it happens in other places. My grandfather was a good golfer, and one of his heroes was a guy named Ben Hogan, who had a really tough childhood and basically invented the modern game. And he was in Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, which is very different than Dallas. And they have this itty-bitty golf course down there that's a jewel. I don't know much about it because I don't play golf. They had some financial difficulties. Charles Schwab single-handedly saved Ben Hogan's Very tournament. cool. Single-handedly did it. Beautiful swing. It's this weekend again. Very cool. Yeah. Get into golf now. Love that. I, I was in it for years, but for full disclosure, folks, I don't play. So, you know, I, I'm, you know, taking notes from you. Story time with TK, <clears throat> Jim Nats. Yeah. That would be cool on CBS, wouldn't it? We, we, should we recapitulate Oak Hill? Coming up. What'd they call the, the third well, You've got to say the name, the Brian poison. Weezer. Yeah. Come on. Got... Brian Weezer coming up. Coming up. <laughs> Guys, this is right. crushing it. In video. Madison and Wolf. <laughs> On media and streaming. It's like that kind of cadence, right? We got this. Yeah, got this. You know, well, it's Thursday. Let's, let's we got to get. By like Saturday, we're into it. CBS is listening, Brown. Oh, just yeah, in case. Just, yeah, pick room <laughs> right up. <laughs>Goodness. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's optimism that White House and GOP negotiators will reach a deal in time to avert a default didn't satisfy analysts. Fitch ratings place the United States AAA credit rating on watch. McCarthy said yesterday a deal is still possible before June 1st, and that's a date by which Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned the U.S. could run out of money to pay its bills. NVIDIA is on track to beat Apple for a record single-day market again. Market gain now shares surging in pre-market after the company's bullish forecast boosted confidence that the chipmaker can keep thriving its business by focusing on artificial intelligence. If the gain holds, its value would rise by $219 billion to an all-time high of $974 billion. And that would top Apple's $191 billion one-day pop in November. Bill Ackman says Hindenburg Research has, quote, outed the way billionaire Carl Icahn runs his publicly traded company. In a lengthy Twitter post, Ackman also suggested shares have room to fall after tumbling Wednesday to the lowest level since 2009. He said Icahn Enterprises reminds him of Archegos. Archegos, referring to Bill Wang's family office that spectacularly blew up in 2021. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I would say all of the soft survey data, but predominantly the manufacturing PMIs, have tended to overstate and understate uh, moves in the actual uh, data in the economy, in the real GDP growth. The second thing I would say is that we're still facing, I mean, we're not entirely out of the bottleneck woods. Very cool to catch up with Vasily Ostjanakis there of City on the latest. Let's get to the latest price action in the equity market on the S&P 500 right now. Equity futures positive by 0.6%. Just a lift off the back of this, a major lift on NVIDIA up by about 28%. Just going to track this one through the morning because if we get to about 32.4%, <coughs> that's a $1 trillion market cap for this name. More than $200 billion in market cap added after some robust guidance. Can we call it robust or just blowout guidance? Just blowout blow out, blow yeah. out guidance yeah, from blow NVIDIA out, yeah. after the close Surge. yesterday. Just amazing. Surge. That market cap number, 755, that's from the close yesterday. So you've got to add on right. what we got. 
overnight in the pre-market. And John, this is critical. This is not a trillion-dollar comparison to other trillion-dollar companies like Microsoft. Those are ginormous companies versus NVIDIA. The, the surge here in NVIDIA, forget about overnight, in the last three, four, five years, down in the pandemic, it comes roaring back. It's a small company at a trillion. In terms of revenue, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. But in terms of growth, and that's what people are paying up for at the moment, I think the team here at Bloomberg did a great job after hours yesterday really <coughs> framing this. And if you are just tuning in, I'll share that with you again. Comparing it to the size of Intel, you've got this chip maker now, six times the size of Intel. Love it. And the company had more than <coughs> twice NVIDIA's annual revenue last year. But yeah. it's about the future. I get all of that. And it's about this story of the moment, and which is why people are so interested in paying up for it big time. Yeah, and, and in the Intel issue is where you get humility involved because a lot of us were on dun, 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 Intel, sure. money forever, IBM, money forever, <laughs> Sam Palmasano, free cash flow. What's Guess what, on? John? That didn't work out. <laughs> didn't work out. I'm with you. And that's a risk that you've got here. Why don't we talk to somebody expert on the strategy and the realities of media moving over into the technology, not so much on NVIDIA, but maybe on Last night's stressful moment for Elon Musk. Brian Weezer joins us now. He's principal at Madison and Wall. And really a lot of experience of how you get there. And where I'm going to go, Brian Weezer, is I think it's called Twitter Spaces. Is that right, John? Twitter Spaces. Twitter yeah. Spaces. And what I would notice is the San Francisco Building Authority talks about the Twitter Hotel because Elon wanted everybody literally to sleep at the headquarters. Explain how you get to last night's debacle over what Elon Musk wrought over the last 12 months. You know, it's always a surprise when you lay off uh, almost all of your staff and the thing that you're building doesn't work, right? Uh, I mean, that's the thing. Like, that was why they had so many extra staff for one of the reasons. I think it's as simple as that. They just don't have a platform that works at scale right now. That doesn't mean they can't rebuild it back to something more meaningful. Okay, they, I can, mean, I think we can, have... they can rebuild it back. But, Brian, how did they get here? They should have known weeks in advance that if you put 200,000 people on John Farrow on Twitter spaces, it's going to crash, right? <laughs> you know, you're right. And I think that the problem is that we're seeing that Musk's uh, ability to run an advertising business is... Uh, not, let's say, particularly good. And I think that that's why the hope with Lindy Acarino taking over there is that she'll be able to push him back. Uh, if he actually wants to have a thriving business, he needs to move away from the business and let her just run it. The public discussion around Elon Musk and his Twitter adventures has been, wow, can you believe he's doing this? This is ridiculous. The quiet conversation among all the media companies is, can we cut people that to that degree as well and still have a functional operation? That was really the feeling at a lot of media giants and the reason why you saw uh, a lot of proposed cuts in certain select places. How much is that a reality versus a fiction built out of hope? And yes, perhaps this is an extreme uh, example, but with AI and some of the other tools, Perhaps there's a bit of truth to it as well. I don't know that there is. I mean, the problem is that technology begets the need for more people more than anything else. We've seen this in the world of programmatic advertising, which is driving so much of advertising, it was automating so many of the decisions that were being made to drive digital media over the last 15 years. It requires more people, not fewer people. It's why agencies have been so positive <laughs> recently. It takes more labor, not less, to do a lot of the work in this world. TV is difficult. Brian, I can tell you, you know, working on both sides of the camera, I know how hard the people work behind it. For me to be able to talk right now through the microphone, to be engaged on camera with you, for this to go out through radio as well. Brian, it's incredibly complex. If there was one person nervous last night, I think Governor DeSantis can break out and bounce back from this if he wants to. He'll go around and go on the media circuit, etc. If I was Tucker Carlson, Brian, watching this play out last night, would he be nervous? based on what he saw? Exactly. And I think that most media partners who require uh, five nines probability of, uh, of a platform working are going to be very reluctant to work with Twitter right now. Again, I think that this actually should arm Linda Yaccarino, uh, I would hope, to, to push uh, Musk to the side as much as possible. Because I, there are people who know how to build media businesses. We're just not at Twitter right now. But Brian, it's also the audience question as well that I'd love your input on. This is an individual, Tucker over at Fox, was just absolutely dominant in his hour. 
multiples of other networks at times, pushing out two, three million people nightly. Brian, when I looked at the numbers yesterday, we were talking several hundred thousand, maybe at a peak half a million. I mean, maybe you saw better numbers than I did, but that was what I experienced when I dipped in and out of the feed, trying to access it. What kind of numbers can the likes of Tucker Carlson expect to attract on that platform? Well, I mean, the problem is Twitter will be limited right now. Uh, certainly YouTube can handle millions of people at the same time. There's lots of platforms that can handle millions of people at the same time, the platforms that actually invest in infrastructure. Well, but then what does this say in terms of streaming being the place for a lot of the new content and, frankly, disintermediating cable, not just with sports, we saw that with ESPN, but also in the news, the direct consumer news business? How much do you actually see that becoming a probability, given some of the challenges, given some of the, uh, the concern around social media being regulated like a media company? Well, that's a separate issue, I think. What Can you run a media business on a, a digital platform and have millions of concurrent users? Yes, I think we're seeing that that works now. This isn't 10 years ago where that was a challenge. Uh, I think that for uh, uh, the bigger issue, for Tucker Carlson, for example, or example to be on Twitter, uh, does that actually dissuade uh, advertisers, probably, uh, from participating? Does it raise risks uh, around, uh, you know, uh, various other forms of concerns for brand safety? Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, I think that the technical issue is separate from that uh, the, the content issue. Well, Brian, why does Linda address the technical issues then? Why is that the right how to I, do that? Well, again, I think that she's not necessarily the person who's going to do it, but can she assemble the right people? Look, NBC Universal has a fantastic lineup of people working behind the scenes on the advertising business. I think they're really well regarded across the industry. And that's where I think a lot of the optimism comes from when you talk to people like me or others who know Linda or know other people from sure. NBCU. Well, Brian, I don't see Elon Musk saying anything about stepping back from that side of the business, do you? He has not yet. Yeah. He has not. You're correct. But I think the goal is that uh, Linda needs to be able to encourage him to step back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I agree. The laughter is warranted. You know, I just got, I just <laughs> got a great idea. Brian, can I put you on the spot? <laughs> if you were still on the yeah. south side and this stock was public, based on everything you've just told me, would you have a buy or a sell rating on it? Uh, I think it's hard to imagine being positive about Twitter as a stock uh, for equity at the current valuation right now. There's no way it's worth what it most recently was changing hands at um, in terms of what Musk was able to raise capital at. Brian, thank you. Bold answer. Good to catch yeah. up. Brian Weiss there of Madison <clears throat> and Wool. Tough moment for that company. Tough. It, it, what's interesting here, as he said, you know, the basic idea is they hire her from NBC Universal and she brings in people as well. So let me get this straight. Elon dismantled it and all she's going to do is restructure it. I mean, that's pretty much the three by five card summary. She also was an advertising executive. And it wasn't necessarily the technical expertise, well, she'll but bring also, in the techies, right? how do um, you get the advertisers back to a platform that's going through something about it and a changed identity, and at a time where there's sort of a question around some of the content? He's got to step aside. Out. I mean, as Brian said, he, there's no indication. John alluded to it. There's no indication Mr. Musk is stepping aside. Everything Twitter, I hear is that she's absolutely Tesla. phenomenal. Totally. And I think it says something <clears throat> about Elon Musk and the future that he's willing to take her on board. It's not really the type of hire that you'd make if you weren't willing to step back to some degree. You'd I, want I someone agree. you could manage. Yeah. That doesn't look like someone to me that you can just manage and, you know, be the puppeteer <clears throat> and get them to do whatever you want. There's going to be some tension there, and clearly he's encouraging that. Do you really think she's going to be like, I just, I suggest, you know, maybe, maybe just, you know, mm, over there. Move she the strikes there. me as I've never met her, but from what I hear from people who know her, that she seems to be a pretty straight talker. I don't think she's going to dance around it. We'll see how it develops. The, the magic of this is I have no exposure to it. I have no skin in the game. I'm a participant in the platform. It's not a public company anymore. The risk is on him. If you look at the valuations, they're still not where risk reward is compelling. When we're looking at the curve, we feel like it's mispriced. We feel like it's already pricing in a recession. This is pretty classic late cycle behavior. We're still seeing strong demand for particular services. People are still releasing that pent up demand from the pandemic. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. 
Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Ramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. Thursday into the weekend? No, it is a very active th uh, Thursday with a sea change in technology. NVIDIA is the story. And, John, moments ago, the NASDAQ 100, the NVIDIA 100, 2.05%. Hey, well said. And you can bury the relationship between tech stocks and the bond market because this is all happening, Tom, with 5% interest rates of the Federal Reserve <clears throat> and maybe even higher. Andrew Hollenhorst, the city publishing just moments ago, he's sticking to their long-held view that this Fed goes another 50 basis points. Tom, 25 in June. 25 in July. Well, alluding to Bullard among the million speakers, we've got more speakers today, right? We do. I mean, a couple, we're not yeah. on holiday yet. The government is, but not the Fed. And then the answer here is it's based on consumption, based on jobs. And with claims coming out here in 29 minutes, there's still no indication of unemployment out there. I know when I say that, people get upset. I get hate mail. But the answer is claims look pretty good. This economy right now is incredibly divided, Tom, worldwide. Manufacturing, not great. Service is still robust. And you've got to make a call here. Are you going to set policy for one or the other or somewhere in between? And at the moment, most people will tell you at the headline level, this labor market is still very tight, which is why that even if they do stop at five, they've got to stay there. And that's why there is some consensus on the committee at the moment. Nobody wants to cut. They want to stay at five, at least. Some people are thinking about going even further. Yeah, and I would even link it into the stickiness. We talked about this, I think, yesterday or the day before. We were transitory a zillion years ago. And now it's the character of inflation in America, not the train wreck in Europe, but how sticky we are. And that means a better nominal GDP, which means better sales, which is how NVIDIA lights up on fire. And you just see it moments ago, Lisa, Ralph Lauren out. Uh, with, with some some interesting numbers. So this is the confusion of this year. We came into this year thinking that te big tech stocks were interest rate sensitive, to John's point. <clears throat> We've learned that they're not. They're both safety as well as reach for growth. They're everything that you want them to be. You want it, we'll have it. That's basically big tech universe. Everyone's missed out. That's what you see in terms of mutual funds. Why would the Fed move away from tight policy, exactly. given the fact that suddenly the preeminence of artificial intelligence and the hope of technology increasing productivity is turbocharging expectations of growth? Where are, you guys are better at this than I am. Where are we now in the parlor game of gaming rate cuts? Is that vaporized this week? It, it's, well, I would say that this week <clears throat> there has been a feeling where we're pricing out a banking crisis. We are retracing a lot of those steps, and you're seeing yields on two-year treasuries go back to about right before SVB uh, collapse. Yeah. You're also seeing rate cuts being priced out of the market, but not fully. So we're not fully <clears throat> back there at a time when you're seeing NVIDIA blow expectations out of the water, and other companies like <clears throat> Ralph Lauren, like many others, do the same. Zombie roll-up. This headline just out from the Wall Street Journal. John Farrell's expert at this. Disney and talks to buy Comcast minority stake in Hulu so that Hulu can sustain in the roll-up that we're going to see in streaming. How many streaming things do you have? Too many. So you can see F1 in soccer? But Hulu is one. <clears throat> and I don't ESPN have Hulu. ESPN is a part of Hulu. And Hulu is a joint venture between a group of companies. Mm -hmm. Disney, of course, need to take out Comcast to then complete the whole effort. And then you do wonder what would happen with Hulu, what would happen with ESPN. Because at the moment you can get this deal where you get Hulu, ESPN and Disney Plus all together, all rolled up all nicely, and it costs you like 90-something dollars now without ads. I, I can't cite it, but somebody said ESPN to ESPN Plus is a $20 stock pop for Disney. I mean, this is all interwoven, isn't it? It's going to be interesting to see what they do. What's, what's yeah. clear is that things have changed in the last six months in this whole industry in a massive, massive way. This big race to get subscribers, throw money at content, things have changed right. quickly. Data check here because our guest is too good to be true. VIX 20 into 19.07 and NVIDIA lift. Futures up. Equities doing nicely up by 0.7% on the S&P 500. Yields higher too just on a 10-year to 374.58. But a move in a two-year is where my attention is yep. for a 10th straight session. Just higher a little <coughs> bit this morning by a couple of basis points. Tom? 439. Curve inversion, negative 65 basis points as well. Uh, it is wonderful to have uh, Diana Amoa with us here, Chief Investment Officer of Long Base Strategies, Kirkenswald Capital Partners this morning. I want to go right to the pro discussion, which is you people say, be an EM, participate in EM. Every textbook, every paper says you have to hedge. To hedge or not to hedge is the core issue with EM. How do you hedge EM right now? Well, if I'm assuming we're talking about hedging the currency risk here. 
Um, I, I go either way you want, but the answer is in, in financial media, nobody talks about this reality that you have to hedge EM. Well, the reality is when you look at performance in the emerging markets, it's actually been quite resilient. Two things that have been quite notable in the last few months, realized volatility in emerging market currencies and also in emerging market fixed income has been much lower than in developed markets. Mm -hmm. One can argue part of that is one, inflation outlook in developed markets is much stickier, whilst in emerging market things appear to have peaked, but there was some support coming through from a weaker dollar in the first half of the year. So that's, that's the reality that emerging market right now this year, if you'd hedged out your currency exposure, you'd have actually been regretting it because most, for the most part, EMFX has done well. Where we are right now, I would say you still want to have EM duration. It's a trade that works in multiple scenarios of the world, uh, irrespective of whether we have a recession in the US, whether the Fed cut rates or not. The outlook for emerging currencies, I think for the next few months might be less clear cut. But if you have a range-bound dollar, I would suggest actually maybe not hedging that. Not hedging. Yes. Let's annoy some people, Diana. It's about 8 o'clock. <clears throat> they've had their coffee. They've woken up. They'll be really engaged now. Dang. When we talk about EM, mm -hmm. are we talking about the US, the UK, Europe? Who are we talking about? <laughs> well, typically people say it's the distress stories that you need to watch about. Where are we talking about default right now, John? The US. <laughs> there you go. Um, but, you know, Classic definition would argue, you know, U.S. doesn't qualify for an emerging market, but certainly what we're seeing right now with this default talk and the lack of consensus on how to manage the fiscal situation is raising some red flags and making emerging markets look relatively not too bad. I have a simple EM test. I've had it for a long, long time. It goes something like this. If things get bad in that country, do you buy or sell the debt? It's as simple as that. Now, typically in developed markets, what you do when things get bad in that country, you buy the debt. Typically in EM, you sell it. What's happening with Treasuries right now? Because I'm struggling with it. I know it's all at the, at the front end, the bulk of it, but Treasuries are selling off and have been for like the last 10 days. What's going on there? Well, this, the, the thing that's interesting with the US market, you're seeing dislocations, particularly in front end paper. Um, things that are going to be impacted by X date. So around the June paper, we are definitely seeing dislocation in pricing. And that's just a factor of the fact that there's no cross default clauses in treasuries. So they can't technically default on a paper without it affecting um, the rest of the curve. And so markets are trading it that way. And the assumption is if you do get a technical default, it's going to be a short lived, um, short lived story and actually might tip the economy into recession. So you're seeing this sort of inversion in the curve where People are buying some safe haven, um, safe haven duration just to hedge against this outcome. So for people who might consider some of the developing world emerging markets, some people on this set who might make that suggestion about the U.S., others would come out and say, what about NVIDIA? What about the tech giants that have performed really well? And they relate this to the bid for U.S. stocks, the bid for U.S. assets over the past decade as being a huge driver. How do you sort of play that story at a time when emerging markets have gotten bid up so far this year, and all of a sudden people are, are realizing perhaps there's something left in the U.S.? Well, if you look at the performance in U.S. equities, I think there's a huge amount of dispersion within that. So it's not a one, one trade for the whole U.S. equity markets. I think it's specific themes that are more longer term and structural, things like the adaptation of AI, what's that doing to various companies and sectors. I think that's a theme that's here to stay. I wouldn't say that that means you buy the whole equity market, but you definitely look for some of these more resilient stories that are going to play out irrespective of whether we go into a recession, Lisa. And then from an EM perspective, most of these innovations are quite commodity intensive. So that's also another theme, whether you're talking about things like um, AI, electronic vehicle adaptation, the drive towards more sustainable sorts of manufacturing, that's a commodity theme that's going to be also a longer term story. How do you understand the valuation at a time when some of these stocks are trading like penny stocks, even though they have nearly a trillion dollar valuation? It's less about that than more about FOMO, in my view. Um, so markets don't know what to do with equities. We've been talking about recession, going from you know, recessions to default. Ma people are jumping on the stories that look sustainable. So the valuations right now are, it's hard to say it's based purely on fundamentals and more about investors being underinvested in equity markets and not wanting to miss out on the winners. If you look at all the cash out there, and I don't mean just, you know, typical investment account cash, but private equity cash, private, just the, the ginormous amount of cash that's been raised. 
do you just assume it will float to equities or does it just stay like a brick in cash? No, I don't think we're in that world where equities is the no-brainer play anymore, especially not when you have such interesting yields in fixed income. And I think for investors, that's probably the consideration where whether you're looking at cash yielding close to 5% um, or even duration in certain parts of the market. So there is money definitely on the sidelines, but I think the days of just buying equities blindly because you had easy monetary conditions are behind us. And mm -hmm. investors will look at a much more balanced portfolio. Diana, awesome, as always, and really good to see you in person. Diana Ramo there of Kirkus World Capital Partners. In many ways, central banks have had an easy life the 12 months previous because growth has been okay, inflation was too high. So what decision do you make? Right. Well, you hike rates, that's easy. Yeah. So everyone sits around a table and makes that decision month after month for 12 months. Okay, then you start to get to the EM story that Diana's been talking about. Downside risk to growth, upside risk to inflation. Then you've got a tough decision to make as a central banker. Last 12 yeah. months, easy. You made the mistake. Guess what you've got to do? One thing, hike. What about now? Well, right, right now is are you restrictive, as Constable says at Mizzou, or are you super restrictive or that? What we know is we're not accommodative. And the trend is there. In Europe, this thing was underplayed this week. Oh, the UK? Oh, yeah. Uh, Governor Bailey. Just grim. Oof. Grim. Let's see what they do. Grim. Jay Bryson coming up at Wells Fargo in about 20 minutes' time. <laughs> Jobless claims drop in as well. Looking forward to that conversation from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The European Union has frozen more than $215 billion in Russian central bank assets since Moscow invaded Ukraine. EU nations reported the new numbers following the bloc's 10th sanctions package, which forced banks to divulge information on their size of their holdings. The EU wants Russia to pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Pressure is mounting on British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on news that migration to the UK surged to a record last year. According to the Office for National Statistics, an estimated 606,000 more people moved to the UK than left. And that's up from 488,000 the previous year. Sunak has pledged to limit the flow. A Chinese state-sponsored hacking group has steadily gained access to infrastructure organizations in Guam and elsewhere in the U.S. That's according to a new report from Microsoft, which says the group is likely trying to disrupt critical communications in the event of a crisis. Microsoft says the hackers, known as the Vault Typhoon, have been active since 2021. Guam has become an increasingly important military and strategic hub as tensions with China ratchet up. And today marks three years since George Floyd was killed at the hands of Minneapolis police. President Biden is marking the anniversary to urge Congress to enact meaningful police reform. In a statement, the president said he'll continue to fight for police accountability and urge lawmakers to honor Floyd's legacy. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Look again, Tom, at the polls. Americans want to see a deal, but they're very divided along partisan lines on what they think that should entail. And Republican voters think that spending cuts, you know, they bought the line that spending cuts are important, and Democrat Democratic voters have, have bought the bought the line that its party is projecting. Leslie Vinja Murray there of Chatham House on the debt limit talks. I don't usually like playing this game, but this game is pretty <coughs> exceptional with this one name. NVIDIA, up 30% in the pre-market. Wow. So this is a session high. And the game I'm talking about is the trillion dollar market cap game. For the number that you might be interested in, if you get to 32.41% higher, that is a $1 trillion market cap at this company. Now, this is interesting because this is not the normal $1 trillion watch. This is a $200 billion <clears throat> plus move in market cap in a morning, in a single session. And Lisa, historically, that is absolutely phenomenal. Unprecedented, I think we could say. Uh, if, if this really holds, they're going to gain more market capitalization increase than any other company in the U.S. history, even Apple, even Amazon, even all of these behemoths that have proven themselves to be at the epicenter of American culture. Intel, 
market cap. Do you want the market cap of Intel? What is it? 120 billion. It's the market cap of Intel. Well, yeah. Think and, about what and, we're doing and, in the free market To be right clear, now. NVIDIA's when compared to Google, you know, Meta and all the rest of them, and I get that, and maybe they're going to do more today. What, what the people would do, John, to your good observation here on how unusual this is, is look at the standard deviation move. And the weekly chart, which is maybe what the pros would use, not a daily chart, which is more inflammatory, it's a 3.6 standard deviation move up to where we are right now. And a trillion dollar company, the, the, you don't, I've never said that. What I'm saying right now, yeah. in all these years, I have never stated that a stock would pop on a weekly standard deviation, 3.6 or 4. Moves deviation. like that, Tom, are associated with much smaller companies, <clears throat> not companies this big. It's pretty phenomenal to see percentage point moves like that. We'll continue to follow. Of course, Bloomberg Technology with some really important perspective on this uh, through uh, the day. This is a joy. Douglas Holtz Eakin out of the Princeton shop has done serious work on the debt and the deficit. I'm not going to demean him by asking him about Oval Office discussions or that, but I'm going to ask him about where we are. Of course, his work with the Congressional Budget Office and president of American Action Forum. Uh, Dr. Holtz Eakin, I'm going to cut to the chase. You go where the CBO goes, which is to try to estimate our growth rates of revenues, which I think is called taxes, and spending. Where are those glide paths going to be after this debt crisis? Uh, I think it's important to recognize that regardless of what deal is ultimately struck, it will put the tiniest of dents in, in our fiscal challenge. Uh, the fundamental problem is in the large entitlement spending programs. Uh, they're off the table. Uh, there's a room to raise more revenue. That's off the table. So we're not addressing the real issues that face the federal government and the budget. And honestly, until we get serious about slowing the growth rate of the big entitlement spending programs, the budget right. will never end up. They, they simply grow much faster than revenue ever plausibly will. I mean, I, I look where we are and we need a commission. So we need a commission with people with Z in their names. So I can really see Orzag Holtzikin or Holtzikin Orzag is an intelligent commission that Americans would know as intelligent people coming to an intelligent solution. And yet we're not talking about that. Why not? Uh, this is politics. Uh, that, that's all there is to it. Um, uh, the, the issue is not the debt ceiling. The issue is not default. There's unanimity that we have to raise the debt ceiling. There's unanimity that we should not even come close to defaulting. There's a big disagreement about the future of fiscal policy. I think it's healthy that this has been highlighted to the American people. And my concern has been that in the 21st century, we've never seen the debt do anything but go up, even relative to the economy. And there's never been the political wherewithal to stabilize it, which is, I think, the necessary condition uh, for the U.S. And, and and we really haven't talked about it. We, If you think back to the, the presidents we've had, I worked for George W. Bush, I admire him greatly, but his budget said, let's win the war on global terror. Uh, you look at the eight years of the Obama administration, the, the only thing that they said about the federal budget that might be a problem is the rich didn't pay their fair share. The Trump administration said nothing for four years on debt and deficits, and the Biden administration came in with really enormous plans to just expand spending. And so, the American people can be excused for not understanding. We have a big problem, and we do. Well, but and it's time they were told that, and that you know, uh, addressing it is the thing that we have to do next. And Doug, they've perhaps been told that, but as Leslie Vinjamori said of Chatham House earlier in the show, it doesn't mean that they're going to accept that they get less on any given day, right. that they're going to get fewer benefits. And there does seem to be a shift on both sides of the aisle to adding, whether it's respect to investing in technology, whether it's respect to with respect to investing in infrastructure, or whether it's just the the uh, the spending that we already have in place. <laughs> It doesn't seem likely that we're going to see restraint in the near future, regardless of what comes from this budget. What's your view in terms of what it would take to make people truly care about a debt limit that doesn't really seem to matter if they could just kick it up and they can keep borrowing at relatively low rates? They shouldn't care about the debt limit. I mean, there, there's no real economic rationale for having a, a debt limit. We're the, the, the major economy on the globe that has one, and it doesn't make any economic sense. They should care about the fact that the spending exceeds the revenues as far as the eye can see, and, and that leads to uh, real threats. They should care even more about the fact that 
because the entitlement spending spending is is claiming all the revenue, there isn't money for real investments. We're squeezing out national security, basic research, infrastructure, education, the things our founders saw as the role of government. And and that's a, a serious problem for having a more prosperous future. And they should care a lot about the fact that those big programs are taking all the money and they're not financially sustainable. Social Security is going to go bankrupt in 10 years. Someone who's 55 literally can't plan their retirement because they haven't fixed Social Security. That's just unconscionable. That should wake people up. What's your sense of the tax revenues? We've been talking about how bumpy and lumpy it's been and that it's been underwhelming. How much is this a lack of investment in the IRS and a lack of tax collection? Uh, we've had a longstanding problem with with the IRS. It's it's beyond merely the technology. Uh, it's it's an organization whose culture has been deeply broken, and and so it is time to to get the IRS uh, back to its job, which is to collect the taxes and do it effectively. We somewhere along the line decided everything should be a refundable tax credit and turn them into a benefits paying organization. They weren't built to do that, and and they struggle with it, and so. Uh, identifying its mission, getting it staffed up, giving it modern technology are all essential. Great to catch up, Doug. As always on this, Douglas Holt in there of the American Action Forum, just waiting for some data in about six minutes' time. Jobless claims are coming out ahead of that. Equity futures right now, positive by 0.75%. And some breaking news on jobless claims, Mike McKee. We've been following this story closely, and you can put some numbers on it. Yeah, there's been uh, some feeling that Massachusetts was overstating the number of jobless claims because of fraud, and the state has now confirmed that. Over the past three months, about 14,300 uh, jobless claims too many. So it drops the total number of jobless claims by uh, about 171,000. So the data we're going to get at 830 is going to be significantly lower. And it is because of a fraud in Massachusetts. So it's going to be hard to parse out exactly what the jobless claims situation is for a while. Other states, including Kentucky, have also reported the possibility of fraud, which kind of raises a question about jobless claims in general and how, uh, va how valuable they are going to be as a uh, predictor of the labor market at this point. Help me here. 30 seconds. We went from 190 to 244 on a four-week moving average jobless claims. Is Mike McKee adjusting the claims vector down because of one little state? Well, the number of people claiming uh, jobless claims that are uh, fraudulent would adjust the vector down. Now, there was an adjustment up from the 190 because of seasonal adjustment factors that is still going to be in there. But it does look like, uh, say, we had 242,000 last week, subtract about 14,000 from that, and it wow. would look like a big drop. 245 is the estimate. I imagine if you had this information, Drama. you might make a couple of changes. The actual number is going to drop next. Get the analysis with Mike McKee in just a moment. The previous number on claims, 242. The estimate before this news was 245. The print up next. Bloomberg surveillance, Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keane. We're adjusting here. <laughs> slightly our vectors this morning. Pharaoh went over to adjust the 9 o'clock vector. He'll be working on a lot of good stuff, including the opening of NVIDIA, which we'll see at 9.30 uh, this morning. But we're, we're looking at his claims. And if you're just joining us moments ago, Michael McKee giving us the great work of Augusta Sariva down in Washington over what claims will be. And so here at 8.30, it's a different claims report than a usual claims report because it's going to be adjusted. And Mike McKee is going to adjust for us right now the adjusted weekly data. Are you able to accomplish this I am, feat? I am able to accomplish this. It reminds me of the airplane. What's the vector, Victor? Uh, right now, 229,000 jobless claims last week. That is down uh, from uh, the prior week's initial release of 242,000. But we've got to see here uh, what the uh, actual uh, revision is going to be because, uh, as we mentioned, Massachusetts reported fraud in its initial claims numbers. About 14,300 a yeah, week just on had the been added right there. in. Yeah. So over the course of the last 12 weeks, that's about 35,000. Yeah, the revision now goes to 225 from last week. So last week, instead of being 242, <coughs> was 225. So we actually <coughs> go up by 4,000. Uh, if you want to figure out what that means for 
the economy and the markets. Go ahead. I know Lisa was struggling to do that, but it does suggest some problems with jobless claims as a sort of uh, well, canary to tell us something about the labor market. Can we look at the second view of GDP numbers coming out, yeah. which I think is a sprightly report, which maybe is that market reaction? Well, we do uh, see that GDP, the second report, uh, first revision, 1.3 percent for the first quarter. That is up from 1.1 percent initially reported. And it does look like a lot of that is consumer spending, up 3.8 percent versus 3.7 percent. Uh, we're going to have to check and see the details of that to see how much of that is inventories as well, which was a big mm. deal in the, the earlier report. <clears throat> but it does suggest that we are seeing s stronger growth in the U.S. Like, than everybody had anticipated. It's like the Bramo Memorial Day weekend plans. They're sprightly plans. Lisa, to look at the two-year yield, 4.43 percent. It's up. I mean, it's up. I but mean, it still is below the session highs and I don't understand why it's not up more especially given that we got downward revisions to some of the prior jobless claims to I, me there is a question of why we are still pricing in rate cuts by the end of this year I don't get it I'll be it you know not I've that never much. I, I've never b bought it for a minute but to me <clears throat> if we do use these as some sort of right. measure then it really signals an employment okay. market that's chugging along just as strong. And I'm going to go claims. You're right. That has some value. But to me, the second look of GDP, folks, is a big deal. I'm going to add 1.1 plus 4 is a 5.1 fake nominal GDP number. And that is adjusted to 5.5. I think that's a big, big leap here in that second look. And there's a third look that we get along the way. McKee's the only one that looks at, <laughs> at that as well. But help, help me here with the animal spirit as seen by personal consumption ticking up in a second look. Well, uh, one of the big things is uh, non-residential fixed investment, basically business spending, which had been uh, very low, revised up to 1.4 percent, so a little healthier than it had been, and uh, consumer spending higher. So overall, the economy going into the second quarter was running a little bit stronger than uh, had been initially thought, which suggests that uh, it may be not unrealistic that we see uh, some reasonable growth in the second quarter. The Atlanta Fed GDP now number, which is it's it's way too preliminary to put a lot of stock in it, but it has us growing at 2.9 percent in the second quarter. Mike, how reliable are some of these data points, especially given potential fraud, potential revisions that have been all over the map? Well, it does suggest that jobless claims around the country have an issue. We saw a lot of fraud <clears throat> during the uh, pandemic, and that really pushed up a lot. I mean, we, we got 20 million jobless claims, and now they're saying well, maybe half that. Uh, so we really don't know. And a lot of these uh, jobless claim systems in the states, we did find out during the pandemic, are running on very old computers, and they don't have a very good ver verification system, and states have chopped their spending on it, so they have fewer people to verify who are getting the benefits. And so uh, it does call into question sort of the whole uh, jobless claims, uh, uh, shall we call it structure, uh, uh, or rather rickety structure. Uh, we did see uh, continuing claims not revised. Uh, they were up uh, 1,799,000 last week. This week, 1,794,000. So very little change in that does suggest that a few of those people fell out. Uh, right. So we're not seeing a declining, deteriorating trend as we thought in jobless claims. Michael McKee with us. He'll be in with us Saturday morning to discuss NVIDIA and the effect on the American economy. Right now, we get interesting GDP revision perspective from Jay Bryson. He's chief economist at Wells Fargo. Jay, do you get a lot of value out of a second look at GDP and, dare I say, the third look? Um, there, you know, there's a little bit of value in the sense of what you get in the second um, release is the first estimate of gross domestic income. It's the income side of the national um, accounts. It should, in theory, be the same thing as GDP. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure what that came out as. So you get some of that. Um, you also get corporate profits, uh, which are also important for, for the economy. So, um, you know, I look at more of the income side of things that, oh, in the second look uh, here than I do, in, you know, in terms of the demand components. Jay, how did data dependent can you be if you can't rely on the data? 
Well, you know, it's you're always flying blind um, in in this economy, um, and I guess what I would say, at least right now, is is you know, you, you, there's a lot of choppiness, there's a lot of noise out there. I mean, I, I kind of the big picture here, I think, in terms of the economy, is it continues to expand. It seems at a I call it modest pace at this point. The labor market, I think, in general, is holding in there, and I think we know that inflation has come down, but it remains kind of elevated, and so I think that's the real narrative that we have to, you know we have to manage to um, at this point. Well, the narrative has been all over the place this year, as we all know, as we've all been trying to track. And I'm wondering whether this idea of immaculate disinflation moved to uh, perhaps rapid inflation to suddenly now it'll slowly go away. and We don't have to worry about it anymore. Is the market underpricing the risk of having to worry about inflation for a longer period of time, forcing the Fed's hand a little bit more? I think, Lisa, that there's something something to be said for that. I mean, if you look at market pricing, and you folks were talking about it earlier, you know, um, at the end of the year, there's rate cuts priced in there. I think some way to make sense of that would be, you know, the market isn't really good at making precise estimates of probabilities. One way to look at that is a low probability of a really big move by the end of the year because something has blown up, whether it's the debt ceiling or, or something else along mm -hmm. those lines. But if that doesn't happen, then I I think that there's a really good possibility that, or there's a possibility that right. you could get stuck at an inflation rate that's higher than 3%. And I, I don't think the market is priced for that because I don't think the Fed would be cutting in that situation, nor would they actually probably be on hold. They're probably raising rates even higher. Jay, the heritage of Wells Fargo economics from John Sylvia to Jay Bryson has just been brilliant on the demographics, the movement, the fabric of this nation. Do you believe in a rolling recession? I mean, we're aggregating in even to the silliness of an NBER estimate of this dreaded R word. But should we have a belief in a rolling recession, given all of the fractured parts of the American experiment? Well, yeah, Tom, and I think there's, you know, it depends what your definition of rolling recession is. I tend to think of one as um, hitting different sectors at different times. And, and so, you know, if you look at housing, housing clearly slumped last year. There's some evidence to suggest that's probably stabilizing. Manufacturing, at best, has kind of topped out. The thing that's holding in there right now is consumer spending. And, you know, if you kind of go forward here, if, if you do have weakness in housing, if you do have weakness in manufacturing, you could see some job losses there. And then that could then bleed over into consumer spending. And so you could have not all sectors going down at the same time, but you could have this, right. you know, as you talk about this kind of rolling, you know, sort of recession um, thing going on. And you mentioned the smartest thing I've heard today was Lisa Bramowitz, our airline analyst on Delta Airlines. I mean, that's the single <laughs> smartest thing I heard this week. It's completely completely ginormous sold out, and that's personal consumption. In one way, that's personal consumption. It's absolutely personal consumption. It will consume sure. your whole paycheck if you try to travel a lot. I do wonder, Jay, though, just going forward, whether we do see some sort of seismic shift coming down the pike for the U.S., given NVIDIA, given AI, given the tech giants that were left for dead, sort of, and then suddenly reprise their greatness <clears throat> this year. Do you think that this is a lasting trend that has implications for jobs, that has implications for a uh, gross domestic product? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way I think about it is AI is a potential a productivity game changer. You know, it's it's another, you know, I don't want to get too dramatic here, but, you know, industrial revolution. Um, you know, maybe it's not industrial revolution, but it's kind of like the you know, when we first went to the, the networking of computers and the Internet back in the late 1990s. I think it's even bigger than that if it um, <clears throat> as it comes along. You know, the issue, though, obviously, mm -hmm. is not only is it a productivity game Game changer. It has profound right. social and political implications, and that's going to last right. for, for years and years and years. Dr. Bryson, thank you so much for joining us. Brilliant. Right. Jay Bryson, there, Wells Fargo parsing. Yes, claims some news there. Thank you to our Washington team for that great reporting on Massachusetts claims fraud. These are markets on the move. The easy answer is Nvidia and the Nasdaq, the, the Nvidia 100. I like that. I get a royalty <laughs> off that. Nvidia 100 out 2.05 percent to 2.20 percent. And the dynamics that we're seeing with the almost 4.44 two-year yield is the twos, tens, vanilla spread 
finally moves with a vengeance. There's something going on this morning with this spike down, a greater inversion. And I'm sorry, 70 basis points is not the same as 60 basis points. It's driven by the front end. People are pricing out the idea of rate cuts, pricing in the idea that the Fed's going to have to raise rates for longer. When it comes to the debt ceiling, we've been trying to, you know, touch on it with a <clears throat> sort of fork from a distance. But we do get some information on that. Kevin McCarthy is saying yes. that they worked well past midnight negotiators trying to get a deal done. Uh, he said that there are a couple of issues remaining. He's speaking to reporters. We're getting, we're getting these headlines. Parsing the urgency of getting something done, the feeling of progress with trying to make sure that, you know, everyone can present something to their constituents that doesn't make them look bad. Barbecue, backyard, hot dogs, hamburgers, Zweigel White Hots, Zweigel Red Hots, beer. I'll let, I'll, I'll let the speaker pick the beer. You know, you gracefully get through Memorial Day weekend. And, you know, my, uh, Tuesday, rather, there, there's a solution, right? That's how this is supposed to work. Do you think they're all going to get together, have a barbecue? Have a barbecue. Figure it out? Mm -hmm. Like, just, can't we all just get Maybe along? Maybe sojourn to Delaware and Pass see the, the president. Mm -hmm. I, think, you know, it's, I think it's just, you know, case of Jenny Cremail, that would help. Right now, 4.43% on that important two-year yield. Two's 10 spread, 69 basis points. Markets on the move. Good morning. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's optimism that White House and GOP negotiators will reach a deal in time to avert a default didn't satisfy analysts. Fitch ratings placed the United States AAA credit rating on watch. McCarthy said yesterday a deal is still possible before June 1st. That's the date by which Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned the U.S. could run out of money to pay its bills. Germany has suffered its first recession since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Europe's biggest economy saw our first quarter output shrink 0.3 percent from the previous three months. That followed a half percentage drop between October and December. The government says lower household spending on food, clothing, footwear and furnishings was responsible for the weak data. NVIDIA is on track to beat Apple for a record single day market gain. Now, shares are surging in pre-market after the company's bullish forecast boosted confidence that the chip maker can keep its business thriving by focusing on artificial intelligence. Now, if the gain holds, its value would rise by $219 billion to an all-time high of $974 billion. And that would top Apple's $191 billion one-day pop in November. Singapore Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong says the widening rift between the U.S. and China appears to be irreconcilable. At a speech at a Nikkei forum in Tokyo, Wong said the situation has become more dangerous amid tensions between the two sides, with the Taiwan Strait becoming the region's most dangerous flashpoint. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Retail stock activity has been dreadful, right? I mean, if you look under the surface, um, retail companies' uh, stock performance, all the cyclicals underneath, below the tech side of the, the skew to the, the index, mm -hmm. is just driving things in the ground and telling you the economy is slowing unconditionally. Daryl Cronk, Wells Fargo, as was Dr. Bryson moments ago. We thank Wells Fargo for their best and at brightest. These are markets on the move this morning in equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. Forget about your Memorial Day weekend. We got to try to get to Friday, 4 p.m. at first. Let me go simply say in the tech space, if we continue to advance with NVIDIA leading the way. We've talked a lot about it this morning. All you need to know is up 1.8% on NASDAQ 100, now up 2.25%. We had to medicate Bramo here in the last four minutes looking at the two-year uh, yield. I've got an 11 basis point move on the two-year yield and even that against a 10-year basis point rising three. Honestly, I was surprised that the move wasn't bigger at the outset when we first got this data. Basically, the jobs market does not seem to be cracking. We could potentially get a deal. Good. Consumption good. GDP revised upward. And suddenly you're looking at a two-year yield that has to really price out some of the pessimism that came in after the potential regional banking crisis. Looking at real yields 
on the two year. This right. is inflation adjusted. They are the highest going back at one point to 2009. So we're talking at suddenly <clears throat> people reassessing sort of what needs to happen from the Federal Reserve. And there's a shift here, folks. It's not just a grind higher. We like to use the word grind. The 10 year real yield, 1.52 percent. And we heard earlier from one of our good guests in bonds that this is a resistance point. I think it was Giannakis, Vasilio Giannakis of Citigroup, where we're breaking out back into a higher range on some of these yields. Again, the 10-year, 1.52%. Uh, the headlines here, and I tell you, they look at the 10-year real yield on balance of power. Anne-Marie Horton and Joe Matthew are all over that. We're going to look at their neck of the woods. McCarthy says not everyone will be happy with debt deal. Well, I would sit on that. That sounds like maybe he's finally telling people. This is what we got. Well, let's see if he can wrangle everybody together to vote for it, right? That's the key. Not everyone's going to be happy, but will they still press? We accept. They're going to work 24-7 on the deal sure on will. the 130 days that they work uh, during the I'm being. It's, it's, go with me on this, folks. And got, but seriously, your balance of power tonight uh, on the debt deal, and it seems to be moving here in real time. Again, the NASDAQ up 2.3%. Stunning. Some of this is consumption in America, and she is excellent on the consumption as seen in the second look at GDP. Jennifer Bartish joins us now. I hate this title. Lisa, help me here. Senior Package Food and Retail Staples Analyst, which means she's only expert on aisle 3, 5, <laughs> 9, and 14 in a big box. What a bunch of baloney. She is wonderful on the state of retail. Conflate Jennifer Walmart to Ralph Lauren to Tiffany's, to Dollar Tree. Sum them all together on the strength right now that you've learned on Retail America. Well, look, what it really is a story about is people are descending into value. They're chasing value. And so wherever there's value, based on your perception, that's where retailers are doing well. So we're seeing you know, people trading down into essentials. Uh, and saving money for splurges, um, whether that's um, experiential or travel, you know, things like that. But the consumer is definitely behaving in a completely different manner than they were a year ago. How much is this really evidence of a K-shaped recovery? And I keep going back to this or a K-shaped recession, whichever way you want to slice it, simply because the higher end stores are able to raise prices and increase margins while the lower end gets crimped much more with much more price sensitive buyers. Um, it really is definitely playing out that way. Um, when you look at the higher end companies, um, they, they are able to pass through, but even the higher end consumer is starting to trade into areas where they can save money. So you've heard Walmart talk about higher income households shopping for groceries at Walmart. Um, I would hypothesize part of that is that they then <coughs> still can have more of their discretionary income to spend on the, the bigger, uh, more interesting things that they're interested in. Um, but it is getting a, to be a harder and harder environment for, the, for anybody who plays in that value customer segment. Jennifer, as we're speaking, we're watching two-year yields rise considerably on the heels of uh, better-than-expected jobless claims, less fewer than expected, a, a good downside surprise, a sense that a labor market is still very strong. What have we heard from some of these retailers in terms of the wages that they are required to pay people, to pay staffers, to keep their stores fully employed? Is this still a concern? Do they still have to pay up? Do they still uh, not have enough labor? It's, it is, if in fact, an issue where they don't have enough labor. Um, it is a competitive environment for labor right now. Um, and the pressure of having to increase wages on an hourly basis or an annual basis <clears throat> is just not abetting. Um, and so we're, we've seen big retailers talk about investing in raising their hourly wages uh, even more than they have been in order to stay competitive. Because you have to remember right. there's a huge cost associated with turnover. When people leave, you have to hire, train, um, and it's often cheaper to pay them more in the short term uh, than the long term uh, impact of, right. of turnover. John, let's play economist now, retail economist. And it's so much of your world devolves down to pretty skinny profit margins. And all of that starts with buoyant revenue units and price, which leads to nominal GDP. So on our show, mm -hmm. we're talking about sticky inflation. Is sticky inflation and better revenue growth good for Walmart, or is sticky inflation bad because their customers are being harmed by it? Well, sticky inflation is good when it's at a reasonable rate, and that's really the key. When, when, when inflation is 
you know, consistent and it's in that three to 5% range, that's pretty easy for most retailers to manage. And it's pretty easy for, for um, consumers to absorb. But when it becomes sticky at a much higher rate, that's where it becomes a real challenge um, because the retailers need to be able to provide value and consumers push back harder on where they're actually spending their dollars. Jen, thank you so much. On short notice here with Markets on the Move, Jen Bartatius with Bloomberg Intelligence, definitive on what we're spending our money on across uh, America. What you need to know is a further lift to the markets, 2.29% on the NASDAQ 100, make that 2.27% on the NASDAQ uh, 100. And Lisa's watching all the different maturities. And I guess we got to go with a 12 basis point, 0.12% move on the two-year yield, rounded up 4.50%. This is the year when narratives go to die. And I will say that because I'm watching the Nasdaq tick up near session highs, despite the fact that you're seeing yields rise. Remember when this used to be the most interest rate sensitive area? It is no more. Now it is about growth. It is about, you know, a good GDP revision actually is a very positive thing because that means more expenditures and AI and other tech uh, investing. To me, I just take a step back. What do we do with this mess? How do we gut check it? Yes, we can see the Fed sort of not really having any incentive to cut rates. That's what we're seeing at the short end. We're not seeing the labor market truly cracking, if we can trust this data. But how much can we really get a sense of whether this is growth and basically a soft landing versus, you know, basically the Fed being forced to do more to curtail some of this momentum? Amy, throw that chart back up there right now. On radio, what you're seeing is a curvature to the NASDAQ 100. And this is convexity. It's not the convexity I use, but we're going to go with it. And I wonder, Lisa, if the curve that you're seeing up, up, up off of NVIDIA is a short cover. There's people out there that don't believe in the NASDAQ, and you wonder how they responded at 4 o'clock yesterday when Romain Bostic said, you know what, this isn't normal. And are they out there covering their shorts, driving up in an accelerant manner the price of the NASDAQ 100. There's that play, which I think is a really good point. Also, Goldman Sachs putting out this report today saying that active mutual funds had suffered an unusually large underperformance of their benchmarks simply because they had been avoiding tech. It had been a story where yields go higher, tech suffers, tech uh, sells off. This is really, really, really important. Three, two, one. Apple's under-owned. That is something. Everybody's like, you're out of your mind. Have another cream ale. The answer is Apple's under owned by institutions. I'll give you some data on that. The average fund, Please. this according to Why Goldman Sachs research, is 15 percentage points <clears throat> underweight Apple, to your point, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, Tesla, and Meta. This according to Goldman Sachs. So in other words, if there is an incentive to buy, Tom, you're not wrong. Right. This is really maybe what's going on as people feel like they're under-owning these things. Single best chart. It works on radio, folks. Stay with me on this. The twos, tens, vanilla spread, the difference in that moonshot two-year yield, and even the 10-year a little elevated this morning, a higher yield, is 70 basis points. We have seen a plunge to further greater inversion, that oddity in the twos, tens spread. It sounds like it's time to talk to Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence, Priya Miser of TD Securities, Bob Michael over at J.P. Morgan and other worthies out there on a shifting uh, bond market. We're going to shift to this. We're into a Memorial Day weekend. No, we're not. Huge activity today and into tomorrow as well. We'll be with you uh, tomorrow to continue to look at this bond market. And, and, you know, what's NVIDIA going to do for us tomorrow? I think that you're going to hear some of the executives just cheering. They're going to be preparing for their barbecue with some extra special. We'll have to see on that. Stay with us on Bloomberg. Good morning.